Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel. I'm Rob and I hope you are having a wonderful day today. Today I have a compilation video with a whole bunch of malicious compliance stories. All right, on to the stories. Let's jump right in. This story comes to us from Sparks32. Boss can't hire with crappy wages, so demotes me instead. Okay, but it'll cost you one million pounds. A few years ago, I worked at a janky 2-bit company. The boss thought he was Billy Big Bullocks and God's gift simultaneously. He had such a big head, I'm surprised he could get through doorways. He used to drink beer at his desk for lunch and would often arrive at work late. He was also an insufferable muscle bro and walked around as if carrying rolls of carpet under each arm. Prick. A few months into my time there, the company starts winning large orders, so he asks me to set up a small-scale production line to increase capacity, and tells me the new hire will be situated there. I design it, set it up, test it all works, and I'm feeling a sense of pride with what I've accomplished. It worked like a dream. I was confident it would work really well for the new hire. Because I'm an engineer by trade, everything was perfect, and only I knew how to fix the broken crap. Nobody else asked how it worked before making some very detrimental decisions. A while later, there was an issue. He couldn't hire anyone willing to accept such a crappy wage and boring work. So Billy Big Bollocks had a bright idea to demote me and make me governor of my creation. No way, not for 9,000 pounds or less. I immediately started job hunting and I told him if that's your final offer, regard tomorrow as my final day. He panics that he's committed the company to a one million pound order due for shipping in three days time. During his alcohol-fueled panic, he tells me to write up highly detailed technical manuals and processes for my replacement. The production line included some precise handwork. Piss off, I can't do that in one day. He also didn't specify what they should contain, and considering I had no help from him with this project, just complaints, I thought, F it. So sure, he got his manuals. I created Word documents with convincing titles like Technical Manual Product Version 2.0 and How to Do This Precise Task. Inside the documents were, for example, the surprised Pikachu face and bubbles from Trailer Park Boys looking lost. Then, below, just one line of text reading, this manual contains all the information I could find or was given. The file sizes would also indicate a lot of text was contained within thanks to the images. Therefore, at face value, they looked legitimate. I saved them to my laptop in an equally legitimate looking folder that afternoon. Early the next morning, I came to work to collect my belongings and do some handovers and found the laptop had vanished. I said my goodbyes to my colleagues and looked over to see him looking incensed with a beer in one hand. He was so angry, he didn't look up from his desk. A friend told me later that the company missed the production deadline despite him working 12-hour days to try to catch up. Apparently, the client was extremely effed off. Don't screw over good people, prick. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Fet Fatal. It says, This system was designed and implemented by a higher pay grade engineer. As I'm just a low paid production line worker, I am unable to produce technical manuals for the widget maker thingy. <laughs> Regards, OP. OP responded and said, Oh, that is glorious. Well, I don't know about you guys, but this story to me was just day drinking boss doesn't know what's going on in his own workplace. <laughs> it kind of makes me wonder though that these technical manuals weren't made when this whole thing was being set up in the first place, you know, like it normally happens in big industry. OP said they were an engineer and everything was done perfectly, but a big part of that process is doing the technical manuals while you're setting up the equipment, so something seems a little bit fishy here. This story comes to us from Anxious Badger 77 you want me to move seats? Okay. I, 21 female, was born with a malformation of my inner ear. On top of making my right ear stick out like an elephant's, it also causes me to have balancing issues. To prevent me from toppling over, I use a cane for support and balance. 
Yesterday, I was taking a train back to my university city. I always get the closest seats to the door, since if the train starts and I'm standing, the chances of me losing my balance and falling over are high, unfortunately speaking from experience. These seats usually have an indication of priority for people with moving impairments, and this train was no different. I got on and sat down with my headphones in. Not a minute goes by when I'm startled by a tap on my shoulder. I pulled my headphones out and looked up to see an older looking man. The first thing he said was, you need to move, whilst pointing to the priority seating sign. I was flustered and was only able to stutter, but, but I do, before he went away mumbling about not having time for this. I thought that would be the end of it. I was wrong. A minute later, the man came back with a train attendant. He just pointed at me going, tell her to give me the seat. I have priority and some other ramblings I don't remember. The attendant wasn't mean or anything. She just said, Ma'am, this is priority seating. Would you please give your seat to this gentleman? I wasn't even trying to do a cue malicious compliance moment. I am just terrified of confrontation and would rather risk wobbling away to another seat, even though the train was already moving. I have one of those metallic folding canes, so I unfolded it and leaned on it to get up. Before I can leave, the attendant just starts waving me to sit back down. Oh, no, it's okay, ma'am. Just stay in your seat. The old man didn't say anything. He just looked annoyed like he didn't understand why he couldn't have my seat. The attendant led him away to find you another seat while the guy grumbled something. I just sat there and enjoyed my faceplant free train ride while drawing and listening to music. Never saw the old guy again, but the attendant smiled at me whenever she passed by. Thanks for reading. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Tunderthighs. It says, <laughs> he needed that particular seat so badly, yet was perfectly capable of walking through several compartments to find an attendant and then walking back with them instead of just finding another seat on his own like an adult. OP responded to this one and said, Respecting elders is very emphasized by our culture, and I think this makes some of them feel entitled to stuff. Another commenter down below called Quartzville Journal said, Sadly, there are many of us with invisible handicaps. Having people making judgments based on what they see is too common. It's the entitled people who think they are not subject to the rules and sit in handicap seating causing this. Just my opinion. While this one played out probably the best way possible for OP, I was kinda wishing OP would have to stand up, the train would all of a sudden jolt, and then OP would end up on top of the grumpy guy, just, you know, to drive home the fact that he was being a dink. I know OP doesn't like confrontation, but this is the kind of thing where you just need to tell them, hey, I was here first, and you have no right to assume, because I don't look like I need the priority seats, that I don't actually need them. This story comes to us from Momito Chan. You have enough parts. No, we don't. I'm not sure if this counts as malicious compliance, but it isn't revenge because there was no such intent. This is my husband's story, henceforth referred to as Hubby. Hubby works for a smallish company that makes medical equipment in the production department. It's important to note that there are multiple teams in the production department divided by product type produced. Each team has a supervisor and the entire production department is overseen by the production manager. One day, Hubby and his coworkers are building a particular product, hereafter called Product A, and realize they don't have enough clamps. Hubby goes to the head purchaser and tells him, we're running low on clamps, please order some. Head purchaser checks the database and goes, According to database, you have 1,000 clamps though. No, we don't. We looked everywhere. There are none. Head purchaser says, Then look again. You probably didn't see them. And with that, he dismissed Hubby from his office. Hubby and his supervisor looked everywhere, but there were none, though the other team had 200 clamps as emergency stock. It felt like either the warehouse screwed up or the numbers in the database were incorrect. Hubby then wrote an email to the head purchaser, CCing Hubby's supervisor, the production manager, and the CEO, that the production urgently needs clamps, and to please order them. He didn't mention the emergency stock of the other team. 
Head Purchaser was angry about the email, stomped into the production hall, beelining towards Hubby, and said something to the effect of, How could you humiliate me like that? I'll show what it's like to be really humiliated. He then looked for the clamps himself, found the emergency stock of the other team, and told Hubby, See, there are the clamps. Just use these and resume the production. Head Purchaser then retreated to his office to write an email to Hubby, CCing the same people as Hubby, including a screenshot of the database page for clamps, and stated basically what he told Hubby about there being clamps, but more politely. Hubby saw the email and went heading to the other team's hall to get 100 of the 200 clamps to resume the production for the time being, stopped by the CEO's office to merely explain the situation to him and point out that the numbers in the database are wrong, using the very screenshot the head purchaser sent as an example. CEO tore the head purchaser a new one for not ordering the clamps immediately. The guy responsible for keeping the numbers of the database up to date happened to be on vacation at the time, but got reamed by the CEO as well when he returned. Cherry on top, CEO gave Hubby's supervisor permission to directly contact the supplier and establish a routine for regular deliveries. Head purchaser was hopping mad about it, but Hubby just told him that they had CEO's permission to do that, and he couldn't do anything about it. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Androshalforce1. It says, regardless of if you have more parts or not, deal with the immediate problem. Order more. It sounds like you're going to use them anyway. Then, figure out what happened to the missing ones. Is the inventory out? Are there other teams hoarding reserve stock? Were they counted incorrectly? Were they defective and not removed from inventory? OP responded to this one and said, I didn't mention it because it was irrelevant to the story in my eyes, but according to Hubby, the database guy is also drawing up and inputting blueprints for the products, and with that, how many of which parts are needed for what product. But he was lagging behind on that. Thus, a bunch of the blueprints in the database are obsolete. This, in turn, made the purchaser order the wrong amounts of parts for a while. Database Guy has since been told to fix that mess yesterday. Another user down below called SquidKing1000 said, Later conversation with purchaser. What would you say you do around here? <laughs> I don't know, OP. I think you could have squeezed a little bit more malicious compliance out of this one. It was pretty neat to see the CEO clamp down on that behavior really quickly, though. A good boss can really hold together a business. This story comes to us from Big Fish Bunny. Can't pocket this key. Not very exciting, but it was still effective. I used to be the overnight cashier at a large grocery chain that was open 24 hours. I worked five nights a week with the weekends off. The cigarettes were kept behind the service desk, which had a locked half door that had to be unlocked in order to access the area. The key to unlock the door was on a regular key ring and I would keep it in my pocket all night because I had to get cigarettes for customers. In the mornings, I would drop the keyring off in the office and it would be waiting for me when I came back into work the next night. There was another cashier who worked the other two overnights during the weekend. He developed a habit of taking the keyring home with him. I would end up having to jump over the counter to get into the area and the daytime employees were pretty annoyed with having to leave the door unlocked all day. After the weekend cashier did this for a month straight, a manager ended up putting the key on one of those large sticks that are often used in gas stations for restroom keys. I felt like a fool having to carry around a big restroom key stick when I was not the one who couldn't remember to leave the regular key ring in the office when I got off work every day. I asked my manager why I had to suffer the punishment of another employee's incompetence, and the manager just explained how we have to make sure the key doesn't accidentally get misplaced or taken home again, and the giant stick is a way to accomplish that. That night, I purchased a large padlock. I used the padlock to lock the key stick to the front of a shopping cart. I then made large signs on poster board that said, Key Cart, and put it on both sides of the cart. To open the door, the whole cart had to be rolled up to the door close enough to get the key into the keyhole. It was a bit of a spectacle and a pain in the butt to do. 
The next night when I came into work, my manager was pretty irritated about the keycard. I told him I was just being proactive and that someone could still take the key home even on the stick, but no one would be able to take the key home if it's attached to an entire cart. It stayed like that for another day, and then it was back to its original key ring that I could put in my pocket. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Pandora Tastic. It says, you padlock the cigarette key to a shopping cart? Where is the key to this stupid padlock? OP starts wheeling in a second shopping cart. About that. <laughs> Another commenter down below called Chatty D said, this story would only be better if you worked at a store where you need a quarter to use the shopping cart. I need a pack of Marlboro Reds. No problem, sir. Can I borrow a quarter? I'll give it right back. I feel like if there was such an issue with that one employee taking the keys home the whole time, maybe they should have been reassigned to a different department, or maybe they should have been working during the day when there were other people there and the keys didn't need to be on them. Another thing that had me wondering is if OP was responsible with the keys, which it sounds like they were, why didn't they just take them off the stick for their shift and then put them back on the stick when they were done? I feel like that's something that could have been done to make this situation a lot easier. This story comes to us from I Think I Saw a 2. You want more details? You got it. This wasn't me directly, but a colleague and a close friend. Many years ago, we both worked in IT at a company. We were in the design team. We would handle future architecture, design, and major upgrades for the systems. My friend, Doug, was working on the phone system upgrade. This was a major version upgrade for the phone management system. We had a change control process in place that involved writing up a brief about the change which was distributed to the respective heads of affected areas, who would approve it to go to change control board, CCB. Once at the CCB, the same people would ask questions and then either approve or deny the change. The manager for the operations team, Dickhead, did not like myself or Doug, decided we were a threat to him despite us not caring about trying to get up the ranks there. We just wanted to do the job we enjoyed. Dickhead had made it his prerogative to do whatever he could to make us look bad. Now, for this change, Dickhead had done a similar change a few years prior, so Doug used Dickhead's original change request as a template to copy off. Dickhead, being the butt hat that he is, sent an email to all involved in the change board, including the branch head, saying the change request was lacking information, and recommended everyone reject the change until greater details are provided. Q. Malicious Compliance Doug was not only a very efficient and effective worker, but a brilliant wordsmith, and wrote top-tier technical documents. As the CCB would only sit once a fortnight, and he now had to wait two more weeks to submit, he had plenty of time to provide details. What is meant to be a simple one-page overview of the change was turned into a 120-page document, with every single aspect of the change covered in excruciating detail. Next, CCB comes around and Doug fronts the CCB for questions. Dickhead thought he would be smart and ask technical questions to try to sound smart. Every single one was met with Doug tapping the printed version of the change request he brought with him. Dickhead never tried that stunt with us again after that. His hatred for us eventually led to him getting demoted by his own actions, but that's a story for another day. OP added an edit at the bottom. It says, Apologies for any run-ons or tangents. I am not the wordsmith. This is why Doug always helped me with anything important including my wedding vows and my eulogy for my best mate's funeral. It is so much fun to put a manager into their place, especially one that treats you like absolute crap. You know, those managers who think their crap doesn't stink? The ones that are the big fish in the tiny little pond? Yeah, those ones. Those are the ones that are so much fun to put right in their place at any opportunity you can. Yeah, screw you, Rick. This story comes to us from Give Me Yuna, the case of the Franking Slicer. Back during the 90s in the UK, when you're in your final years of secondary education, or you could call it your GCSE years, the schools did something called Workplace Experience. This was basically where you find a job where you spend two weeks experience working after you leave school. 
even then, I found it pointless for many reasons. In my case, I couldn't find a job that would accept me, so the school went looking and found one for me. To make note, I wasn't the only one the school had to help on this. Well, the school found me a placement in the office at a dedicated mechanics education school. Basically, it was a mechanic shop like any other, but where the mechanics working on your car or van are students training for their mechanics qualifications. While I was there, I wasn't allowed to do much, like they didn't want me there at all. So I was given menial tasks, deliver documents to offices next door, fetch coffee, use the franking machine, and other stuff. It was like they just volunteered me to do stuff they didn't want me to do. However, when it came down to it, it was mostly simple, easy jobs, apart from fetching coffee from the staff kitchen. They had this little room which was called the mail room. It wasn't big. I could stand in the middle of the room and touch all four walls. There was a desk attached to the wall and a shelf above it with a bunch of mailing bags, the usual stuff you'd find in a mail room of an office. In this case, there was a franking machine in the middle of the desk with two baskets to one side used for placing mail ready for franking, one for first class postage and the other for second class. For those not in the know as to what a franking machine is, you'd have better luck looking them up, but I'll give you the footnote. When you get mail and you see in the top right printed markings instead of a postage stamp, that is where the franking machine comes in. Businesses can go to Royal Mail and bulk buy postage or whatever. I'm not exactly sure how it works. The franking machines print those postage details onto the envelopes instead of a person going through the hassle of removing postage stamps from the stamp books and making sure to stick it in the correct place on the envelope. With the machine, the job is done quickly. So down to the malicious compliance. As you have figured out, this compliance was with the franking machine. I was taught how to use the machine. It was already pre-programmed with what to print. All I had to do was select whether to print first or second class postage. Then I would slot an envelope into one side like I was swiping a bank card to pay for groceries. After the envelope enters the machine by a certain amount, the machine activates and pulls the envelope through. I soon found out that this machine had a temper. Sometimes it would take its time pulling the envelopes through, other times it'd yank the envelope out of your hand and shoot it against the wall. Surprisingly, with an intact, properly printed Frank mark. One day I was told, go do the mail, and so I did. I slotted an envelope into the machine and it did its usual. However, with one new result. It had sliced open the envelope. As in, you can remove the letters etc from the inside of the envelope, like someone had just opened their mail with one of those letter opener knives. I grabbed the envelope and went to my boss. The following conversation isn't exact, but you get the idea. What do you want? Surely you haven't finished with the mail already? No, I've barely started. Then go finish it. I can't. There's a problem with the franking machine. There's always a problem with it. Just go back and finish posting the mail. But it's slicing the envelopes open. I tried to show her the sliced envelope. Boss ignored the envelope. She said, just frank the mail, will you? Or is that too difficult of a job for someone learning how businesses work? Okay, but it's not my fault if something bad happens. I turned and returned to the mail room. Along the way, I grabbed some paper and wrote on it that I apologize for the damaged envelopes, that the machine was slicing them open, and that my boss refused to listen to me about it. Then I proceeded to put envelope after envelope through the machine. Every one came out sliced open. I must have done a couple hundred of them for first class alone. Once done, I didn't put them in mailbags. I just neatly piled them at the side of the machine with the letter on top. About half an hour before the end of my shift, someone came into the office carrying several of the envelopes and my letter. I quickly found out that he was the boss of the business, as in the highest position. He'd apparently stepped into the mailroom with a few of his own letters for franking and found the pile. After arguing with my boss and me being blamed for it like I was snooping into every envelope to see what I could find. So I volunteered to show what was happening. My boss and her boss grudgingly accepted my offer, so I grabbed a sheet of plain paper from the nearest fax machine and a fresh envelope. 
Putting the paper in the envelope, I asked Big Boss to seal it as confirmation that it's sealed. I then led them both to the mailroom, at arm's length so they can both watch me. I gently slotted it into the machine until the machine took over. Sure enough, the machine coughed out a freshly sliced envelope. Then, my boss tried telling me off for not telling her, only for me to say that I tried, but she refused to listen. I only did what I was told. I was let off in the end. The next day, the machine was unplugged, so nothing was getting posted. The day after that, there was a couple of piles of postage stamp books, which of course, I had to stick on the envelopes. When I returned for my second week there, I was shown how to use a brand new machine. This new machine was a dream. Just imagine you had spent 10 years driving the same car until it was falling apart, and then you finally upgraded to a new car that is so new the mileage on it was still double digits. Until I left that place, I was still given menial tasks, but my boss never ignored me again. A few years after leaving school, that business closed up shop. The building then got taken over by a big brand tire company that also did MOTs, alignments, etc. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Tintin Tinuvi. It says, As a manager, this kind of behavior always mystifies me. It's so easy to just wait 30 seconds and get pissed off at stupid after you've verified it's stupid. Also, teaching is fun. Even if I had someone specifically hired or acquired for free to do the odd jobs, they should get started with PPE, SDS, safety procedures, in between stamps or staples or what have you. A high schooler can learn those things, plus basic vehicle services like oil change, and leave with extremely useful life skills. Another commenter down below called Really Can't Not said, Franking machines even now can be temperamental AF. I work for a third party business that handles outgoing first class mail, and the main franking machine we use to meter mail, just over a year old, peels strips off the backs of envelopes. Started doing it about two months in. It's been fixed, which of course means it's now worse. OP responded to this one and said, quite a few businesses these days in the UK outsource their printing for mailing to independent companies. Basically, they email documents to the printing company who prints the letters, puts them in envelopes, and then ships them off. You can see this on the envelopes as the return address is usually the printing company. Okay, so I have experience with the machine like this. I've never heard it called a franking machine. I don't know if that's something from overseas or whatnot, but it's called a postage meter where I worked. And it actually had a feature on it where you could tell it to open every envelope you put through. It wouldn't print postage when it did that, but there was a feature there that brought out a blade and would cut an envelope open. I'm guessing in the case of OP, that one had the same feature, and maybe it was just sticking out because it shouldn't have printed postage and cut the envelope open at the same time. So maybe just a little bit of tinkering to get the blade to go back in would have fixed the issue. This story comes to us from Oddzone4359. Boomer got malicious compliance on me. Warning, this is wholesome AF. This is also a throwaway account Anyone who knows me will be able to ID me from this story. I have a hobby that I turned into a small business. It's not a lot of money, but it's kind of nice and it's a thing that I enjoy doing. Over the last five years or so, I have developed a reputation as a man of my word and someone who provides a great product at a fair price. I live in an area that has a lot of vacation homes around a lake. These homes are owned by people who have $500,000 or more to spend on having a place on the lake to go on weekends during the summer. Mary and Steve were two of these people. Mary and Steve own a couple of businesses. They are known for treating people fairly. Even people that they have fired will tend to acknowledge that they had it coming. Mary stopped by my shop back in September. She wanted to hire me to do some work for them for Steve's Christmas gift. I could do what she wanted me to do. I gave her a price tag of $5,500. She agreed instantly. We shook hands and I went to work. I got it finished up December 20th, just in time. I had to take a few days off from my regular job to make it happen. Mary was thrilled at the results. She went to get me a check and she wanted to write it out for $11,000, double what we agreed on. 
I declined, telling her the $5,500 was what we agreed to, and that's all I was going to take. December 26th rolls around and Steve shows up thanking me for his Christmas gift, gushing over the craftsmanship, then complains I wouldn't take the bonus money that I was offered. I explained to him, Mary and I agreed on the price and we shook hands on it. A deal is a deal. Steve says to me, well, at least let me buy you and your girlfriend dinner 21 times. He had a big crap-eating grin on his face. I should have known he was up to something. I thought about it, thinking local restaurants and agreed. Then he said, my choice, any place I choose, all on my dime. In hindsight, this should have clued me into the fact that he had something up his sleeve. I smiled, laughed, and said, okay. The entire month of January went by, I didn't hear anything from Steve and Mary, which is fine, we're not exactly in the same social circles. At the end of January, all of a sudden, my girlfriend just got super happy, like giddy. I knew she had a secret she was keeping from me, but I wasn't sure what. She told me pack my bags for a Valentine's Day trip, we would be gone for 10 days, and bring my passport. We would leave on the 10th of February, 19 days ago. We got to the airport, and who would you guess was there? Steve and Mary. I was shocked as crap. Steve said he had a debt to pay, and he owed us 21 meals, at the time and place of his choosing. And he chose Rome over Valentine's Day. I tried to say no, he threw my words back in my face, a deal's a deal. The four of us spent the next week in Rome, Italy. Steve and Mary paid for our flights, hotel room, and 21 meals. All of our tours and transportation was on us. We got back home on the 22nd of February. We had a great time. Okay, so part of me on this one is like, hey, I get to go on a trip and it's going to be awesome. And part of me is like, um, I got to spend 10 days in a place I don't know with people I don't know. <laughs> Anxiety, anyone? I truly hope that Opie and his girlfriend were able to make a lasting friendship with this other couple because it sounds like that's what this other couple wanted, you know, taking them on a trip across the world for 10 days. This story comes to us from Affectionate Yam 886 This is not a mistake. Last year, I was ordering an upgrade for the server room at work. It was a large, expensive upgrade that cost over half a million dollars. If you've ever had to call a manufacturer to order equipment at this amount, you may know that once you get a good reputation with the manufacturer, they tend to cut red tape for you to maintain a good working relationship with your company. I, in the past, have bought equipment for my personal use at home, and it takes forever to get a rep on the phone, and they often screw you on the deal. While I was making the order with the manufacturer, I inquired about getting personal equipment to see if it would be possible to make a separate order for myself with my own money. The rep had no issues with it and was happy to make the second order. He placed both orders and even gave me a company discount for my order. Now, I did make it perfectly clear that the second order was a personal order and not in any way connected to the corporate account or order. He confirmed this and the order was locked. A few months went by and the equipment showed up in the loading dock at work and everything was in order. However, my order never arrived at my house. I attempted to contact the manufacturer, but got put on hold for hours. I gave up for now and figured I would try again in a few days. The next morning, the equipment showed up. It was an exact match for the equipment that was sent to my work. Now, keep in mind, the order I placed for my house was a blade server that was just over 6,000 US dollars. This was not what I ordered. I went into panic mode as I can't afford this equipment and when they bill me, I will be screwed. I checked my bank account and found no charges yet. Now I'm really panicked as now I think they billed it to my company, effectively double charging them. I expect I will get fired. When I returned to work after my weekend, I emailed billing and got a copy of the invoice. Well, they didn't bill my company for the equipment sent to my house. Now, I'm really confused. So at this point, I drop it. It is a pain to get them on the phone, 
and I can't call the corporate line when it's a personal order. A month later, I got an invoice in the mail with a late charge for failure to pay. Okay, now I can get this fixed. I see that they want $6,000 plus $250 for late charges. That's odd. I call the retention number and get a rep. I gave her the account number and she told me she needed to transfer me to a manager due to the amount. Okay, cool. The manager picks up the phone and I try to explain the bill is wrong and the equipment they sent wasn't what I ordered. And he immediately cut me off with, you need to pay the invoice, you're in violation of the contract and we will sue you if you don't pay it immediately. I tried again to explain the equipment issue but again he cut me off and demanded I pay. So I told him I would take care of it then. I said sorry for being an inconvenience and I will call my bank right away. I then confirmed the bill amount and the part order number from my equipment labels. He confirmed it and said, see, there was no mistake. And as I was about to hang up, I know I heard him say in a smug tone to someone else, that's how you deal with poor dickheads called my bank and got them to unblock the transaction. It was stopped for fraud alert. The amount was paid. I am now the owner of a half a million dollar server room in my basement. A few months later, I had to order some more connectors for the fiber lines and spoke to their rep again. I inquired about buying personal devices again since the last time went so well. Apparently, they can't do that anymore. Something about a manager fraud investigation? can't imagine what that's about. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called El Smurfo. <laughs> it says, your electric bill will likely make up the difference in not too long. Another commenter down below called Bonnie Moni says, think I would have tried to sell it. Even half price is a substantial reduction on a mortgage. Gotta say, I probably would have tried to sell this myself as well. But then I got to thinking, how big is the market for something like this anyway? The only people that are probably going to buy this are going to be big corporations and they're not going to go through somebody in the public. They're only going to want to go through a business that has warranties and service, etc. So you're kind of stuck in that case. Unless you really break it down and part it out and put it up on eBay or something, I don't know. What would you guys do in this situation? If you're on YouTube, comment down below. And if you're on the podcast, well, go to YouTube and comment down below. This story comes to us from Stratton MTB. There will be no dirt on your tires. So I've worked at an outdoor retail store for a little over two years now. The employee turnover rate at my job is pretty high, with most only lasting a few months. Thus, I have become one of the more knowledgeable employees and I work primarily in the bike shop. Now, the bike shop manager also happens to be head bike tech, meaning he is often busy repairing and building bikes. He has taken a liking to me and as such, I do most of the part ordering, repair check-ins, and restocking and merchandising of the department floor. One of the few employees who has been working longer than me bought himself a brand new fat bike last spring. He lives in a small apartment and so he stores his bike at the shop as the bike shop manager and the store owner allow it. However, it is meant to be stored in the warehouse, not on the shop floor itself. Well, one day we got a large order of bikes that we wanted to put on the floor. I went and asked this employee if he could move his bike to the warehouse or if I could for him. He told me, yes, you can bring it to the warehouse, but I don't want dirt on the tires. It needs to stay shiny and clean for the winter. Also, please put it in a corner or something where it won't get dinged or scratched. Well, I am a kind and accommodating coworker. However, I don't fancy having to carry this large bike the 500 feet or so to the warehouse. So I decided that I'd make sure no one would scratch his bike. In our warehouse, half of it is dedicated to back stock and the other half has our paddle sports department. In the back stock side, half of that is large shelves like you'd see at Costco or other large grocery stores, and the other is bike racks for our stock that won't fit on the floor. The top of these shelves are usually left empty as we don't have a forklift, and there usually isn't enough merchandise to facilitate needing that extra space. This open space, 
20 feet off the ground is where my malicious compliance took place. Carefully, I climbed the ladder to the top of the shelf, carrying his bike on my back. Once up there, I carefully tied it to the post that was left up there and stood it up on some cardboard boxes so as to not dirty the tires. I then climbed down and moved the ladder. I then continued about my work and finished the merchandising. My bike shop manager has a great sense of humor, and so when he went to the warehouse to grab a bike in for repairs, he about lost it when he saw what I had done with the bike. He came back into the store laughing his head off and agreed that it was a justly earned prank. My coworker who owned the bike, on the other hand, did not find it quite as funny. He is shorter than me, and so he could not reach high enough when on top of the ladder to get it down. When I left in the fall for school, it was still up there, and I imagine he will have had to get another coworker to get it down for him. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Appropriate Rip 9996 It says, best move your own bike and not ask others to do it for you. Another commenter down below called Linglass said, We are talking bicycles, not motorbikes here, yes? That or you are the Hulk carrying a motorbike to the top of shelving. OP responded and said, I wish I could put a motorbike on my back and climb a ladder. This was just a human-powered fat bike. I believe a Corvus Akio, if I remember correctly. Wait a minute, so OP put this bike up on top of the shelf and then the guy who owned it never had anybody bring it back down? and OP worked there for a long time afterwards, and it just stayed up there? That's kinda odd. I guess I'm just not understanding why you'd leave that bike up there. I mean, they cost anywhere from $1,100 to $3,900 for that particular model. Why wasn't he riding this thing? <laughs> Was it gonna go up in value over the years like a sports car? I don't think so. This story comes to us from Refresh98370. Your tickets need more detail. Been lurking here for a while, thought it was about time that I contributed. As I reflected on my career in IT, I recalled this particular situation. Back in the day, I was a field tech for an IT company. My teammates and I were contracted to an aluminum mill in the upper left-hand corner of America. The place was huge. It's the only place that I've worked as an IT guy where I had to put on a hot suit to go in certain areas as part of my job. So one day I get this ticket for a computer that wouldn't turn on out at the other end of the plant. So I grab a power supply and head off in the golf cart. No joke, this place was so big, we had golf carts to get around. Important later is the fact that we used paper tickets with all the information for the call out printed on the ticket with space for use to write what was done, etc. We'd bring the resolved tickets back to the manager and he'd put the data into a wacky access database for tracking. I get out there, and sure enough, the power supply is deader than mashed potatoes. I even tested with a multimeter to verify. I swap the power supply, machine powers up. I update my ticket, and off I go back to HQ. End of day comes eventually, and I hand off my fistful of tickets. The next day around lunchtime, I get some of my tickets back from the manager with a note, needs more detail. I point out to the guy that there is not much more detail to be had, using the power supply ticket as an example. Test power supply, test bad. Replace power supply, PC powers on as normal. He wasn't having it though. He accepted the tickets back, but made sure that I understood that I needed more detail on my tickets. Okay, fine. Later in the afternoon, I get a call for a bad floppy drive, perfecto. I grab a floppy drive off the shelf and race out in the golf cart. Upon arrival, I do my normal test, diagnose, replace, update process, with the exception of adding excruciating details to the ticket. 1. Attempt read of two known good floppy disks. Insert floppy number 1 in drive. Attempt DIR command, unable to read disk. Remove floppy number 1 from drive. Insert floppy number 2 in drive, attempt DIR command, unable to read disk. Remove floppy number 2 from drive. 2. Power down system by pressing the power button on the front right corner. 3. Disconnect and remove monitor. Disconnect VGA cable from PC. Disconnect power cable from monitor. 
remove monitor to safe location next to desk. 4. Remove top case from PC. Remove left hand case screw with 14 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx bit screwdriver. Remove left hand case screw with 16 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx bit screwdriver. After securing screws in safe location, remove top case by sliding forward. Secure top case to safe location next to desk. 5. Remove failed floppy drive from PC. Disconnect power cable from 3.5 inch floppy drive. Disconnect data cable from 3.5 inch floppy drive. Remove front left screw from floppy drive with 12 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx bit screwdriver. Remove back left screw from floppy drive with 11 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx bit screwdriver. Remove front right screw from floppy drive with 13 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx bit screwdriver. Remove back right screw from floppy drive with 12 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx bit screwdriver. Slide failed floppy drive forward to remove from drive cage, etc, etc, etc. The process documentation went on like this, filling the entire front of the ticket and continuing on to fill the back of the page. It was a thing of beauty. It took me about 20 minutes to write this all out, describing the replacement of a floppy drive in excruciating detail. At the end of the day, I turned in my stack of completed tickets to the manager with a smile and a wave. Next morning, as we do every morning, we have a quick team powwow to discuss any special items that need attention for the day, things to watch out for, things we missed previously, etc. Kind of like a scrum before there was such a word as scrum. During this meeting, the manager begins talking about proper documentation of tickets. He holds up my masterpiece and plainly states that this is a bit much. Just note on your tickets in a quick and concise manner what the problem was and what you did to fix it. Nobody ever got the business again for not being detailed enough on their tickets. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Jeffrey F. It says, Sometimes you must just give the diarrhea so they know a good thing that they had. <laughs> this works with emails too. When you flood their inbox because, heck, they wanted it, suddenly the way you were doing it seems fine now. Another commenter down below called Contraintier said, Darn, he was too spineless to go right out and say, Sorry, OP, your way was fine after all. Man beat around the bush, admitting you were right. What a prideless idiot. This story is just a prime example of make sure you know what you're asking for because sometimes you just might get it. I was actually kind of surprised that the manager didn't hold up OP's ticket and just say, this is how it's supposed to be done. I can think of a couple managers I had in the past that would have said, yep, that works because they didn't want the embarrassment of saying that they were wrong. This story comes to us from Patty Cake. Want me to shut up? Okay, argue about it till you give up. Then I'll fix it. This is from the summer between freshman and sophomore year, circa 1989, about 15 years old. This is my best recollection of events. One of my best friends was going on summer vacation with his mom and dad, only child, and they let him invite a friend to go with him so he wasn't alone. They were headed to see the Grand Canyon, with the final destination being Las Vegas. We were driving from South Louisiana. We were riding in a Lincoln Town Car for the trip, circa 1988. This car had the type of trunk where you'd close the trunk and it would latch about two inches above the deck and then a motor would pull it down the rest of the way, tightly closing it. They would open it by hitting the trunk release, which was a button in the glove box. This friend's parents were known to argue. We'll call them Mr. Friend's Dad and Mrs. Friend's Mom. They would get into shouting matches just about anything. My friend had learned to just be quiet when this happened, but I didn't have to do that with my parents, so I wasn't used to that. They had planned to stay at little hotels on the way, and we were probably somewhere in Texas the first night when we arrived in the evening at our hotel. They popped the trunk by hitting the release in the glove box, and we got out to start getting our bags to take them inside. But when they tried to lift the trunk lid, it was still latched. My friend's dad tried hitting the release button again. He tried pushing the trunk closed again to start over, but the motor wasn't taking it down. He tried looking under the trunk lid in the two inch gap to see if he could loosen the latch manually. 
Meanwhile, I had an idea I thought could fix the problem. I kept trying to say my idea while he was checking all of his fixes. MFD, why don't... Quiet, I'm trying to think here. After he tried a couple of things, the arguing started between mom and dad. They argued about... What are we going to do? We can't get our luggage. Do we get something to break it open? But then we can't keep it closed to travel. Should we call a tow truck? Etc. I tried to give my solution and was shut down every time, ending eventually with a, Shut up, y'all go sit in the car. So we did. A few minutes later, they came and got in the car and told us, we're going to have to cancel the trip and just drive home through the night. As it got quiet and I finally felt like I could talk, I said, why don't you just use the key? There was a notable pause as the idea started to sink in. Oh my goodness, that's so smart, MFM said as they both hopped out trying the key. The trunk opened right up. They came back in the car after a couple minutes and apologized to me for yelling and told us that we can get our bags and keep going on the trip. For the rest of the trip, the motor part of the trunk didn't work to pull it all the way closed, but we were, though, able to continue. The trunk would latch and hold two inches above, being completely closed, and the key worked to open it. We just hoped there wouldn't be any rain in the desert. We got to hike into the Grand Canyon for about an hour down, which took two hours to come back up, and got far enough we could barely see the Colorado River in a space between two crevices. We drove over the Hoover Dam and in Las Vegas. We stayed at Circus Circus, which at the time had a kid's section full of arcade games and other attractions. Every time MFD or MFM would win at the slots, they'd give us more money to spend. All in all, it was a fun trip. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Sovamind. It says, Glad that you weren't fully compliant and eventually shared the key tip for them and got to continue the trip. OP responded and said, I was compliant until they cancelled the trip, laugh out loud. Then that hurt me, so I had to say something. So, OP, what you're saying is that the moment where you told them they could just unlock the trunk was the key moment to continuing on that trip? I think because most vehicles have gone to a key fob these days, people forget that keys are actually a thing. And how many of you with a key fob don't realize that there's actually a little key inside of that key fob for most of them anyway? This story comes to us from Ancient Educator 76. Let's go! Here's some malicious compliant as quick as it is violent. I teach in the Valley of the Sun. In the fancy part of town, I can't afford to live there. We have a new gate-to-gate -gate cell phone policy where students cannot have their phones out at all, anywhere, for any reason. If I see a phone as a teacher, I am authorized to commandeer the phone until security comes to pick it up. Fair enough. I've decided way ahead of time that I wouldn't touch a phone unless I needed to, especially during the initial confrontation. I simply say, Shmoopy Pie, please place your phone on the grade table adjacent my desk. And then I put a sticky note on it. I even make sure I only touch the phone through the sticky note as I affix it with their name on it. I then call security who picks it up. This hasn't been an issue all year. The kids are pretty good about it, but not this time. Our security guard Dave enters the room. He seems to not be able to find this miracle hot pink sticky note a fixed phone, so I reach for the phone to hand it to him. As I grab the phone to hand it the 30 inches until it reaches Dave's hand, the student runs up like the bionic man and places his hand on the phone also, grasping it tightly. I don't know why I hold on, but I do. Instinct, maybe. Anyway, he demands that I let go. Let it effing go! And the second he emphasizes that word, I let go while he pulls as hard as he can. The phone flies across the room and breaks the school window, as well as itself. Both items are shattered beyond recognition. The fallout is just starting to fall, but the kid was, What the F did you throw my phone for? Crying and lying at the same time. Wonderful. I said back in the heat of the moment, Hey man, you told me to let it go. I did. This is on you, my guy. Dave couldn't agree more. His parents probably could agree a little less. Administration was, surprisingly, on my side about this. 
The parents did contact administration about paying to replace the phone, but they flat out denied it. They said that the student committed a bare minimum of two acts that led to his phone being destroyed. He, one, had his phone out, and two, clawed a teacher in the process of grabbing his phone he already relinquished to his care, and finally three, destroyed a window. The fact that Dave was there to witness all this was very helpful in making sure the ultimate malicious compliance being applied had only negative consequences for the culprit. I'll never understand why he, after 10 minutes of the phone just sitting there, did decide to all of a sudden come for it. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Z Edgar Hoover. It says, without getting into the, is it reasonable to take phones away? Here's a guess about why he got weird. Adult material or adult messaging or something on the phone and not locked. He knew you weren't going to look at it. Dave, not so much. So he suddenly realized the risk he was facing and used typical teenage judgment. All right, somebody needs to explain to me why there's a full cell phone ban. I mean, I can understand having them put it away and not bring it out while classes are in session. But what's the problem with using a cell phone in the hallway? You know, for a couple of minutes in between classes on the kids own time granted back when i was in school cell phones weren't really a thing <laughs> oh my gosh i'm dating myself but uh i don't understand this one so somebody explain it to me in the comment section down below and if you're listening on the podcast make sure to jump over to youtube and comment on this one down below this story comes to us from ladder station 2328 before nine and after five don't matter I worked for a large brokerage firm in their mutual funds division. My duties included working on special projects for the controller, coordinating with the users on any issues that needed to be addressed, and working on automating all processes. I loved my job and was really good at it. As I had these various tasks, I had two computers so that I could run the programs that I was modifying while still working on other tasks. As I stated, I loved the work since I basically did what I wanted to do with minimal, if any, supervision. Due to this, I regularly came in early, sometimes as early as 7 a.m., and staying as late as 7 p.m. I easily did two to three times the work of anyone else. I was always the first one in, and generally the last one to leave. One day, I took a lunch break, which was also rare, as I brought my lunch and worked straight through. Unfortunately, I had some errands to run, and I ended up getting back after taking an extra 10 minutes. I was summoned to my manager's office, where he reamed me for an hour over these 10 minutes. I had enough of this, and I asked him if he realized how early I got in and how late I stayed. His answer totally blew me away. He said, it doesn't matter how early you get in or how late you stay, only what happens between 9 and 5 that counts. Q, malicious compliance. I stopped going in early. I would take a walk or read a book until 8.55 a.m. I would take a break mid-morning, take exactly one hour for lunch, and another break in the afternoon. I would stop work at 4.45 p.m. and clean my work area. Exactly at 5 p.m., I would shut down my computers and leave for the day. He never said anything about this as he knew he brought it on himself. All that resulted from this is he lost over five hours of work a day from me. Not long after this, I left for brighter pastures at an increase of total compensation of almost 100%. It was possible as I went to a very high-scale investment firm. Later on, I found out that they had to hire three people to do my work. Like they say, you don't know how good you have it until it disappears. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called the Old Man 1313 It says, I love these tales about managers who are so fixated on something small and inconsequential that they damage their own organization. A lot of managers make decisions to satisfy their personal needs. In your case, either control or structure, not for the good of the business. I feel that this fact is glossed over a lot when discussing economics. I don't know, OP, I kind of feel like you were putting in extra time when you really didn't need to. It sounds like you were still able to get your job done between the 9 and 5, even though you were maliciously complying with the schedule. Before, you were giving them your time, and there was no extra compensation for that. 
I'm sure before this situation, you knew that your manager was a butthole, so I don't see why you put in all those extra hours knowing that nobody would really appreciate it. This story comes to us from MD Lapla. Workers stage a coup against the manager. Circa 2005, I switched jobs. The new job came with an awesome perk, three months working in Spain. I lived back then in Argentina. All expenses paid, earning my salary plus an extremely generous per diem. For me, it was awesome. It meant that I would get pretty much the salary of a year in three months, plus the opportunity to visit Europe and travel for the first time. The caveat was that the project was a nightmare. The consulting company that hired me had won a really big bank project and overpromised. We had to finish the project in a really impossible time frame. That's why I was going there. It was kind of an all-hands-on-deck situation. When I arrived there, working hours were ridiculous. 9 a.m. was the starting time, and we rarely left before 11 p.m., sometimes even being there till 1 or 2 in the morning. I had no problem with that. I was living in a hotel. The only people I knew in the city were in the project as well, so we bonded over the situation. My colleagues were also really supportive. They made a point that I wasn't going to work on weekends and told me that we work our butts off Monday to Thursday, but on Friday afternoon, you're going straight to the airport. You have to take on the opportunity to get to know Europe. We'll get by. The problem, as usual in this situation, was the project manager. We used to call him Soron. He was a manager that took pride in saying, I started working in this company, I met my wife because of this company, I got married because of this company, I got divorced because of this company, I live because of this company. He was middle management, so yeah. Since hours were really long and pretty much everyone was exhausted from the night before, the tech team, minus Sauron, used to stroll down to a cafe down the street at 9.15am and have a hearthy breakfast while we planned the day ahead. Team leaders were included and it was a kind of impromptu and informal scrum meeting we held. One day, Soron and I had a meeting with the client in the office. While I was there, client said to Soron, by the way, I'm going to need this and that for this afternoon. And Soron said, okay, I'll go down to the bullpen and ask someone for that. Be right back. Just keep on with the meeting and I'll join when I get back. But he never came back. The meeting finished with me and the client and Soron never came back. After the client left, two hours later, I went down and found that nobody was in the bullpen. Not a single soul. Not Soron, nor the team. And then, I heard screaming from one of the meeting rooms. I opened the door and found the whole team shouting at Soron, and Soron shouting back. Soron was furious because the team was at the cafe. The team was furious because he had no right to be angry about that since everybody worked an insane amount of overtime with no complaints. And Soron said, I don't effing care. You're hired to start your work at 9 a.m. You have to be here at your desks at that time. That's what we're paying you bums for. One of the team leaders, seeing that this was going nowhere, said, okay, and ended the meeting. Soron pretty much disappeared all day having meetings and such. And then at 7 p.m., we all left. Since Soron asked us to work the hours they were paying us to work, we finished the shift and left. And we did that the next day, and the next one as well. We did it for a whole week. Soron missed a couple of milestones and got an earful by the client and his bosses. Soron realized his screw up. He became docile and never complained about anything else. Not the cafe meetings, and not even about the seldom longer than usual lunch. We did work a lot more hours than what he was paying us for, but the environment became more relaxed, and Soron made a point of trying to be at the bullpen the shortest time possible. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Crime is Legal. It says, What a doormat team. Malicious compliance that consists of not doing free labor. Well, there seems to be a little bit of a theme between these last two stories, and I'm going to say it again. Why would you work extra hours for a company that doesn't appreciate you for it? And they're definitely not paying you for it either. You're on this team because they need help here. It's kind of obvious why they need help.
This story comes to us from Fire Ice 1992 Having a Coup at Work. I read a thing on here earlier, and it reminded me of my favorite malicious compliance I had the pleasure of being a part of. About 10 years or so ago, my father helped me get hired at the manufacturing company he worked at. I worked hard and instantly joined the union they had. After working there a few years, I was working as an operator, and I knew the machines we had and was learning how to repair and maintain them as well. The company loved to make operators work a lot of hours. 60 plus hour weeks, but we managed and the unions got us double time after 60 and any time on a Sunday. The only caveat was we were allowed one weekend a month that we did not need to work and we all usually agreed on the weekend or drew lots. One month, we were crazy busy. Every machine operator was working seven days a week at least 12 hours a day and we felt it. We came to the last weekend and assumed that meant no work and a much needed break, until the plant manager posted that we all had mandatory overtime again. We demanded our rep sort it and ended up having an all hands meeting. The plant manager screamed and told us we were all lazy and with what we make we should be begging to work more, and our union rep slapped down the contract with that part highlighted. The plant manager said, let me make it easy for you louses. Any machine operator that is not here this weekend better find a new job. We all looked at each other and nodded, confirmed the rep had heard that and went back to our machines. That following Monday, we agreed to turn them off or ignore all their calls for the weekend. Our phones exploded. Apparently, the union already started on them for wrongful termination and violation of the contract. Then, we all said, per our meeting, you fired me, so no, I am not coming in. Funny enough, we were rehired with higher pay, and the union demanded an amendment to the contract that limited work weeks to 6 days, up to 70 hours a week. Topping off all of it, we came back that Thursday to a party announcing our new plant managers, because they fired all of upper management and brought in a whole new team. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, we have one from a user called Particular Car 8520 It says, That's not malicious compliance. That's malicious destruction of a terrible system. You and your crew are awesome, and the fact that everyone was in makes this the most malicious compliance I have seen in this sub. Congrats. Another commenter down below called Slightly Buttholic said, This highlights something that can and does happen when one is dealing with a highly skilled workforce, with highly marketable skill set. Someone with marketable skills can find a new job very quickly, and if they have been in their trade for any time at all, they know exactly where they can get it. The employer needs those people a lot more than those people need the specific employer. This creates a potential situation that I like to call collective quitting. It isn't collective bargaining. You aren't saying that you will stop working for a little while or slow down production. There won't be picketing or any form of demonstration. People just quit, permanently, and en masse. It's like a run on the bank. I've seen companies get hollowed out within a day, and it's not a strike. Those workers aren't coming back. They are just gone. They will likely have a new job before the end of the week if they didn't arrange for one the day they walked out. There is also the sudden bleed out, a few of these skilled people leave for another employer who probably has multiple openings. The first worker who leaves calls his friends, informing of the deal he got and how many other slots they have to fill. And once again, they aren't coming back. The OP could probably make good on the threat if this coup didn't work. He could probably find a new job before he ran into any real problems, especially since it was an actual dismissal and he could file for unemployment in the US. Does anybody else think, hey, that union rep is sitting back looking at everybody and going, <laughs> management effed around and found out. This story is literally showing us what unions are for, what contracts are for, and why you don't F with the union in the first place. This story comes to us from HBP Frost. You hate my clothes? Have fun wearing them. Growing up, I've always liked Germany and Japan, especially the cars. My favorites are Porsche and Lexus, and my mom's ex-husband wasn't into cars. He hated just about every piece of clothing I owned. I have mostly Adidas stuff and a few shirts and hoodies, 
with Porsches and Lexuses on them. So one day, when I'm getting ready for my first day of school after the pandemic, mom's ex-husband, who I'll call Keith, not his real name, but his actual name is so bad, it might as well be Keith, stops me and looks at me dead serious and says, I want you to take off those raggedy pieces of crap and throw them in the trash, along with any clothes you have in the washer. I looked at him, laughed, and walked out the door. I thought I looked pretty good that day, and it made me really happy seeing my friends really hadn't changed since March. Then, when I got home, Keith was stuffing all of the clothes from the washer into a trash bag. I asked what he was doing, and he said, I'm tired of you trying to present as rich. Take this bag out to the trash, and don't take anything out of it. I looked at him, and I kept repeating how he can't be serious. He said he was dead serious, and went into my parents' room. I decided to see how much of my clothes I was going to lose, and to my surprise, it was just some socks, a pair of jeans, and two shirts. I was about to take them out when I noticed Keith threw his clothes in there too. He's a stereotypical stepdad and doesn't do anything, so there's no way he would have known my mom washed his clothes with mine. Then I took a moment to check some receipts in my room to see how much I'd be set back if I actually put this bag in the trash, and I figured out it'd be around $40. Not much of an issue there. So this is when the malicious compliance kicks in. I took the bag to the trash can and set it at the end of the driveway for trash day tomorrow. It comes at 6. So imagine Keith's surprise when he gets up at 6 to find that he has no clean work shirts, no clean socks, and no clean pants. It made him absolutely livid, and he quite literally yanked me out of bed to scream at me. He pinned me to the wall and yelled about how his clothes were missing, and I told him, your clothes were in that bag, and had you been paying attention, you wouldn't be in this situation. He just got up and walked away, struggling to find anything to wear. He eventually came back and very calmly asked to borrow a shirt and pants from me, along with socks and a sweatshirt. I then proceeded to hand him each of the clothes he asked, but they were ones I didn't like and didn't wear often. He spent the whole day posting on Facebook and Instagram about how bad he looked, and it was so funny that I couldn't put my phone down. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called SuspiciousTurnip77. It says, Wait, tops with pictures of cars on them or Adidas branded clothing is presenting as rich? Laugh out loud. Keith needs to pull his head in. OP responded to this one and said, Oh, it gets even more stupid. When I first was learning how to drive, he would tell me in between screaming and trying to hit me that I'll never own a nice car like a Kia or a Dodge. He drove a Dodge and would complain how they are the worst luxury brand America has to offer. I'm actually really surprised that OP didn't take their clothes out of the bag and hide them somewhere and put out the ex-husband's clothes just all on their own because it would still look like stuff was in the bag and he wouldn't know any different. There was another commenter that asked OP if the ex-husband had ever been charged for slamming OP up against the wall and OP said no but he doesn't really care because the ex-husband is living a life right now where he's getting exactly what he deserves anyway. This story comes to us from Ancient Educator 76 you better pay for my son's phone. Sure thing, I'll send you a bill. Today marks the beginning of a new era. An era where the school district stands up for itself and thumbs its nose to the 1%. Today's malicious compliance is really a continuation of an original malicious compliance from two days ago, where a student demanded I let go of their phone. So I let go and let both his phone and a school window get damaged. Originally, administration was letting the parents know there is no way that they will be paying the parents for a replacement phone in this instance. A security guard and 34 other students witnessed this kid take his phone aggressively out of the teacher's hand and subsequently launch it across the room. It was 100% the student's fault. Administration was willing to drop it and move on, hoping that the family of this student would do the same. This was definitely not the case. The parents of the phone thrower demanded that the teacher, me, OP, pay for this phone, saying, you better pay for my son's phone. 
this is when admin of my middle school with district backing performed the best malicious compliance I've seen in a bit. I'm proud to be at my school district today. The district has come to the conclusion after investigating the incident, getting statements from students, witnesses, me, security, etc., that it was the student's fault that the phone flew in the air. The district agreed, however, to pay for the student's phone as it was technically in a teacher's possession when it got damaged. It was an iPhone 12, so the check was probably around the area of $800. Then, administration did them one better by also sending the parents a bill for the window to the tune of $1,678. It wasn't a typical window, nor is it easy to replace. Once the teacher let go of the phone, it was in the student's possession, so now it's the student's fault. I'm not sure if this is the argument they made, but I'm presuming this is their justification for it. Doing some quick math, it looks like they're paying 800 something dollars either way. Plus, the student is in ISS for destruction of school property. I don't know, I think the phone was in the teacher's possession, but it was only broken as a direct result of the student's actions. Same thing with the window. The teacher had absolutely nothing to do with the phone being broken or the window being broken, and thus, the school shouldn't be responsible for either. If the school really is required to compromise though, I think they should send them a bill for the window and just take a credit off for the current value for replacement of an iPhone 12. We're talking $280 to $330. This story comes to us from Lance Adams v. CISO. Return to office and dress code. I work in IT for a manufacturer, a global organization with offices in more countries than not in countries. 30,000 employees globally. Our really good CIO, who was technical enough to get it, and smart enough to realize that a global organization needs global people from all areas with wide ranges of skills, he retired abruptly. He led us very well through the uncharted COVID waters and we did well. His replacement was named and was a high level financial guy about two years ago. Many of us knew what this meant. There are some very accurate memes and colloquialisms about finance guys destroying IT. Just around his one year anniversary, he announced that we must return to the office and use the same emotional appeals about collaboration and missing something with remote work as the other brain dead executives around the globe. After a couple of weeks of enforced two core days a week for only the office he worked at and the other corporate office in the neighboring city, we're a set of mergers and acquisitions with multiple key offices. Anyway, after a couple of weeks of this return to office, Email was sent about dress code, clean jeans. It would be best to wear company branded shirts or polos. After all, IT is on the same floor as the executives and he's not going to look good bending the knee if us serfs are dressed in t-shirts. Comments were made on the side by middle management on how this would reflect poorly on reviews and merits. The malicious compliance part. I decided to purchase a four pack of high viz polo shirts, bright yellow, bright orange, teal green and gray, each with reflective striping. For the last year, I have worn these shirts every core day. We are, after all, a manufacturer. Our corporate office is attached to a manufacturing building, where high vis is required. Along with hard hats, hearing protection, safety boots, we take our safety seriously and I applaud that. Today, my manager let me know that both the CIO and the senior director that I report into after a few layers of yes people have commented that my shirts are not liked. My manager said that it's totally up to me what I do, but he strongly recommends picking my battles and not wearing those shirts anymore. So I leave with this. I'm writing up an ethics complaint now, but what should I wear next week's core days? I'm thinking about showing up in my suit and nod to those two cowards who can't even say something to me directly. Thoughts? Jumping down to the comment section on this one, we have one from a user called CoffeeTulu42. It says, My suggestion? Keep wearing the same high-vis polos and file a complaint with HR that, as an IT worker in a space attached to a manufacturing plant requiring safety gear, you have done your best, at your own personal cost, to ensure work-appropriate attire that also meets safety standards 
and you're now being singled out by members of leadership with implied threats to your performance evaluations because you are prioritizing work-related professionalism over irrelevant appearances while fully conforming to the workplace dress code to which you are now subject since the cancellation of work from home. Get the paper trail going and find a good employment lawyer for the inevitable retaliation lawsuit. While you're at it, check to see if you are in a one-party consent to record state. If so, get a pocket voice recorder so you can get evidence of any future conversations about your attire. OP responded to this one and said, Found the player. I've thought of several of your suggestions already and noted down the others. Hat tip. I don't know, OP. I think it's time to pull out the top hat and tails, <laughs> complete with a walking stick. Extra points if you're dressing better than the executive team and people think that you're higher up than them. This story comes to us from Sacred Fruit 8486 Entitled Mother Tells My Mom to Handle Her Kids. I posted this in r slash entitled parents, but someone commented that it counted as malicious compliance too. So I'm posting it here as well. My 17 female mom, 41 female, took me out to get makeup the other day for a friend whose birthday is coming up. We entered the store and all was going really well. I was checking out concealers while my mom was on the other side of the shop looking through various shades of lipsticks. Enter Entitled Mother, late 20s, female, with her devil spawn. I say devil spawn because her kids were misbehaving wildly, and she didn't bother even once to tell them to stop or something. Not even a minor rebuke. I say devil spawn because that about sums these two kids up. They were running wild around the shop, throwing testers around and being a general nuisance. My mom stepped in when the kids started poking their slimy little fingers into the lipstick testers. I get it, they're just testers, but ew. People are likely going to use those to decide whether they like the shade or not, and God knows where those fingers have been. Like, one of them was legitimately picking his nose minutes ago. My mom, having four kids of her own, looked around to find their parent. Entitled Mother was the only one in the shop besides us. My mom called out to her, and this is how the conversation went. Excuse me, are these kids yours? I know, very obvious, but my mom is a very polite person, so it's not odd to me. Yeah. Can you please tell them to stop touching the testers? They're not toys. If it's such a problem, why don't you handle them? Oh boy. My mom left the shop for a few minutes and signaled me to not follow her. She came back with two buff security guards in tow. The kids were still poking their fingers in the testers. The guards walked up to the kids, and in the deepest baritone ever, one asked, Excuse me, what are you doing? The kids looked terrified and cued the waterworks. Entitled Mother immediately stormed over and began reprimanding the guards for scaring her poor widow angels. She then saw my mom nearby. You did this! At this point, she was practically hissing like a cat. How dare you teach me how to parent? Mom, in an eerie monotone, you told me to handle them, hence I handled them. She screamed more obscenities at my mom, the guards, anything around really, but the guards weren't having it and told her to leave. She created quite a scene, but thank everything that is holy, she left. My mom had quite the story to tell at dinner a rather comedic encounter with an entitled parent. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Esther Clemens. It says, Ask and you shall receive, laugh out loud. Wish that entitled mother would have learned something, but I doubt it. OP responded and said, The lore narrates she's still telling anyone with ears not to comment on her parenting skills. I feel like OP might have missed an opportunity here when the mother wasn't really responding to what OP was trying to say, OP should have looked at the kids again and said, yeah, those things are actually for drawing on your clothes. You know, right on your shirt and on your pants. You can make beautiful pictures with them. <laughs> Honestly, though, respect to OP's mom because going and getting the security guards was probably the best option in this case. This story comes to us from Irate Alligate 1. Too busy to queue? Okay. Enjoy your 40-minute wait. I worked security for a popular phone company in Dublin City Center. It's the flagship store and it gets very busy. We have this one guy, I'll call Mark, 
mostly because it's his name. He is rude, entitled, and ignorant. He comes in one day when there's a queue of maybe six people and walks right past it. I call him, he stops, and I tell him to join the queue. He tells me he's too busy and needs to speak with someone. I'm about to approach him when the manager looks at me and gives me a reassuring nod. He's got this. So Mark walks straight to the manager who is clearly doing some managerial stuff and the manager tells him to wait, he's clearly busy. It's Ramadan so the manager is fasting and not in a great mood. I'm waiting nearby because I can feel this is going to kick off because the manager is so hangry and you can smell the food from the upstairs break room wafting down like the harbinger of tastiness and or hypoglycemic rage. I know the manager will probably kick off as bad as Mark will. I wait about 10 minutes, my eyes darting between the rest of the shop and the two would-be culprits when I see the manager put his pen down and close the logbook thingy he was working on. Still looking down, he takes a deep breath and looks up with a smile. Mark steps forward and the manager puts his hand up. Not you, I'll serve the ones in the queue first, he says in his sternest but professional voice. Fine, is all Mark can say, giving me a serious amount of side eye. At this point, the queue had grown to over 15 people. I had to move away from that side of the shop to keep an eye on everything else. Mark looks at me and I tell him, again, to join the queue. No, I'm okay, is all he manages to get out. Fine then, wait outside the queue. Every time the manager finishes with a customer, Mark takes a step forward only to be rebuffed by a hand wave. The manager alternates between this and directly addressing the next customer to come to him. Mark won't go to the other member of staff because she has made an absolute show of him in public. Mark is a creep and up until then was barely tolerated by staff. He knows better than to try her. So Mark waits and waits. People come and go. Mark sighs loudly every time the queue grows. He mutters something every time the manager tells him to wait. 40 minutes go by and the queue is down to one person. The manager goes for a glass of water and it's just me, Mark, the other staff member, and the customer. There is also a guy on the floor but only two points of sale so he's kind of irrelevant. Sorry bro. He is fuming. His face is pure red and he is clenching his fists. I slowly walk near him and stand nearby. He knows to keep his mouth shut around me so I watch him quietly burn in impotent rage like an incense cone. The customer leaves and he stomps to the staff member who gives him a look and says, what? This woman has negative time for him and less patience. She's a lovely woman and a great member of staff otherwise. This is just how crappy Mark is. Mark starts to blather on about an issue. The staff sits there for five minutes and lets him rant. It's vaguely offensive, but he knows better to insult the staff directly. When he finally finishes, she just tells him that's a contract issue and to ring the call center. Technically, she could have helped, but didn't have to. Mark gets mad. He demands the manager. A staff member that was working the floor goes up, takes his sweet time, comes back down with a cup of tea for himself and the other staff member, sits down and tells Mark the manager is on lunch. Cue a bunch of insults and slurs and I ask him to leave. He squares up to me. He doesn't even reach my chest. I struggle to keep a straight face as the staff starts giggling and he slinks out. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, we have one from a user called Pinata's Crap. It says, F you Mark, F you very much. <laughs> OP responded to this one and said, The dude later tricked my colleague to give him my manager's number. Mark had been threatening to get me fired, also claimed he trained me and my boss, so he arrogantly showed me the number before dialing. Boss didn't pick up for a few minutes. He then rang the manager of the shop who told him what was going on. He, my boss, then picked up the phone and I saw Mark almost jumped with joy before putting the phone on loudspeaker. He got a sentence and a half out before my boss went off at him, telling him he will come down and bounce him off every wall in the city center if he doesn't stop harassing the staff and security. 
He spent the next few months standing out in the street, making hilarious threatening gestures to me before the guard eye, police, saw him one day and warned him. Another commenter down below called One Quirky One said, This is nice. You all know each other and have each other's back. So with that in place, do you naturally coordinate dealing with this customer out of necessity or is it for sport? OP responded to this one and said, He would be a troublesome little crap. He used to do loads of creepy stuff around women and try to act tough around the men. I'm trying not to be too specific, but imagine a fat Farquad from Shrek with a balding hair and a club foot. Someone whose physical appearance would normally result in a great personality, but somehow he is a bitter man who throws tantrums. He used to come around so often, I had a whole folder named after him of incident reports he caused. The whole squaring up to me was hilarious. I'm not very tall, but this guy tried to get in my face and couldn't reach. Pure Napoleon complex comedy, like a sweaty baby trying to bare teeth at me. In general, I looked after the staff and buffered some of the more unhinged parts of the general public. Except one lad who was a brick crap house and I've had to tell people that I was actually trying to protect them from him when kicking them out. I've got to be honest, I've worked in retail quite a bit over my years and there are customers that you just want to mess with because they're so miserable for no real good reason and you just want to see if you can make them even more miserable before they leave. Does that make me a horrible person? Well, maybe, but I'm good with that. <laughs> this story comes to us from Wise Reply 2377 You really want me to go home? Okay, you lose a client. So this is a funny story where I know I wasn't exactly in the right, but it was still malicious compliance. So I'm a software engineer and I'm a gal. So as you can imagine, I'm always either the only or one of very, very few non-males in the team. This malicious compliance is from a previous job of mine. I was the primary software engineer on a project. One random Wednesday, yes, I remember the day of the week, we had a meeting scheduled with the client. This was a large company and the client was in a different country, so the meeting was scheduled virtually. Now, if you know anything about me, I'm a bit of a promiscuous gal and I guess this day I was being a bit silly and wore a dress that was a teeny tiny bit too short. At lunch, I was told by my manager that someone had complained and I needed to go home and change. I knew I was wrong and immediately apologized but I brought up the meeting I had coming up. Now, as per company policy, we could not take any company equipment home unless we were scheduled on call or unless we had permission. I could not take this call from home without the company laptop I needed to demo something. And I knew none of the other engineers on my team could manage the demo. Yes, they knew how it worked, but no one knew it as well as me. And they had to refer to manuals to do the demo and answer questions which is not a great presentation for the client. So I offered two options. One, I get to take the company laptop home for the night. Two, I sit in one of the conference rooms for the next hour and a half and then join the meeting from that room. I was told neither was an option. I either had to go home and then return after changing or go home and join in the call via a telephone and let a teammate present. I presented my arguments and my manager then told me that I should change and come back. There's no ways I was doing that, mainly because it would take too long. I made that clear. So he offered that I could take the next off out of my unlimited medical leave if I came back because he knew how important the client was. I once again suggested I take the company laptop home. I had done it multiple times when I was on call, so it wasn't a trust issue. He said, no, that's only when you cannot take a call from the office. I gave one more shot to explaining that even if I went home and left right away, I would miss most of the call, but he did not care. He said he would take care of the call until I reached. I said, okay, and put in the next day off along with an email confirming what we had discussed and then headed home. I obviously was not in a rush. I got home changed, and went back to the office. As soon as I left home, I started receiving frantic calls asking where I was. 
I explained that it would take me 45 minutes to reach the office if traffic allowed and they should start the call. Bottom line, no one was prepared. Everyone freaked out and made a mess of the presentation. The client was unimpressed and did not move forward with any further projects. So yes, I messed up, but I was willing to make up for it. He did not listen to me and chose to dismiss my statements. So I did exactly what he wanted. Could I have stopped at a mall five minutes away and picked up leggings? Yes. Did I choose to follow his instructions by the letter? Yes. OP added an edit down at the bottom. It says, edit, I cannot reply to so many comments. So thank you everyone for your comments. I want to clarify that the problem was not with my outfit being too short for the meeting. If the meeting had happened before the complaint reached my manager, I'd have gone home and taken the L on the half day. But the problem came because I had to attend the meeting and they had to enforce their punishment on me. I forgot to put the outcome. The manager did try to blame me, but I simply reminded him that I had told him about the issue and emailed him the discussion of our meeting. I had explicitly told him this would happen if he sent me home to change, but he said he would handle it. He wasn't that bad of a person to say that didn't happen, so he simply used that to make our lives harder about everyone being fully involved in all projects, which meant a lot more meetings and a lot less work getting done. So I quit not much longer, and I know multiple others did because it was affecting bonuses too. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called 8 of Clubs 343 It says, so your dress was too short for a virtual meeting where mostly only your face would be visible to the client. And rather than them just sucking it up for a day, they lost a client because they sent away the one person who actually knew what was going on. I get the dress code is a thing at offices, but if this client was so important, then I think they could have just left it at come back tomorrow with appropriate clothing instead of leave and come back. Well done on the malicious compliance, their fault for not being prepared. OP responded and said, exactly. I accepted my mistake and that's why I was willing to sit in a conference room so I wouldn't bother anyone with my short dress. It wasn't that the dress was too short for the meeting. They just said it was too short as per policy. I want to jump back in this one to the point where the manager said her dress was too short and she responded by saying she knew she was wrong and immediately apologized. Everybody in the comments on this one is harping on the manager for being a bad person, but OP's the one who went in dressed like that in the first place, knowing full well that it was breaking their dress code policy. So the manager may not have handled this one properly, I will definitely give people that, but it also sounds like they're just dealing with an employee who has done stuff like this before, and they just don't want to give that employee any leeway because they'll do things like this again. This story comes to us from Away Location. No overtime? No problem. Been working at this job for some years when I got a new manager. A month or so into her working there, she came into my office and told me I wasn't allowed to work overtime anymore. And if I have any issues, we can discuss it. The way she said it sounded like she was expecting this to really hurt me. I sent an email to confirm the conversation we had and her response basically said, correct, no more time theft. I didn't really like that accusation. I usually stayed a little late by 30 minutes at most to finish up projects. A lot of projects come in last minute and other managers were thankful for my help. So I quit staying to finish projects and wouldn't start a new one if there wasn't enough time. No real issues, but some projects started falling through the cracks. I let the other managers know my manager told me no more overtime and I'm just following orders. Fast forward barely a month later, as I'm leaving for the day, she rushes to me asking if I can work on, you guessed it, a last minute project. It's potentially worth millions. I explained how I've got plans and I'm not about to be a thief. Next day was too quiet. In the afternoon, I get a request to have a meeting with my manager and HR. Usually, you get a written complaint beforehand, so I'm still a little off guard. I could at least be a little prepared. At the meeting, my manager reads off grievances like it's an intervention. She frames it like I have antisocial, behavioral issues, insubordinate, and I don't go the extra mile. 
if you let her keep going, I wouldn't be surprised if I was somehow to blame for the company not reaching its goals. When she finally finished, she had to have started writing that the night before and into the next day. I asked if it's okay if I have my say. I pointed out a lot was just her opinion, and I'm overall well-liked. I always do exactly what she says. However, my manager likes to constantly move projects around while I'm working on them, and I'm not allowed overtime. She denies ever saying this, so I forward the email to HR. My manager then starts backtracking. She didn't mean it permanently. HR takes me off the call a bit. When they come back, it's just HR. And I start by saying, I'm not signing anything. They tell me, let's agree to disagree. This has been one big miscommunication. And they appreciate all the work I do. I ask to confirm if this was going to be held against me in any way and they said no. They went on to say, if I can stay late sometimes, great, but it's also okay that I leave after my eight hours. My manager later quit in less than a year. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Gemini27. It says, please hold it against my manager. Here's a note to put on their file, and I'll expect to see them tomorrow to hear their apology. OP responded to this one and said, never got an apology and after the meeting, where half of it felt like personal attacks, I just wanted to go. Hearing how I'm the worst person just made me emotionally exhausted and yearning to go home. I did bring up the theft remark constantly whenever there was a remote possibility it would get me out of work. Their response was basically, it was just a joke. The general manager was aware of it, but had an are you unable to manage sink or swim attitude. I don't think he liked my manager much either. I have a quick two points to make on this one. Number one, if you're not being appreciated for the overtime that you're putting in, don't put it in, especially if you're not getting paid for it. Number two, document everything from when you're talking to managers, higher ups, or employees that you just don't like. <laughs> you never know when you're going to need to use that to cover your own butt. I'll throw in a bonus number three here as well for the managers. If your employee has just told you they want something in writing, you need to double check what you've just told them to do because they're trying to hold it against you. This story comes to us from Funky Splash Monkey. <laughs> Demand that your money be moved? Don't let me tell you that this is a bad idea? Sure. Some of you might recall that financial crisis that happened a bit back circa 2008-ish. At the time, I was working in a call center for retirement accounts such as 401ks or 403bs. For any non-Americans, these are plans from your employer where you can contribute a portion of your salary. And usually, they will also contribute something as well to save for retirement. This is probably the biggest way that Americans save for the end. As the account holder, you have control over how the money is invested usually from a small selection of different mutual funds. Also, about the call center, I had some experience. I knew what I was talking about and was able to speak with confidence in my voice. Therefore, I was on the escalated line. This is reserved for the people who want to talk to a manager. I was not a manager, but I and others like me got these calls. In some rare cases, we actually fixed a problem but more often than not, just told the customer the same thing they had just heard from the first rep, only with that level of confidence. Then, they hung up as a happy customer. We also had the ability to review previous calls to the center. So one day in April of 2009, an irate client was transferred to me. He had just gotten his quarterly financial statement, showing that he was invested in several different funds, that were affected by the stock market. His complaint was that he had called a month earlier to request that his stock market-based investments be moved to something more stable and less risky. At the time, the news was all doom and gloom, leading people to make majorly ill-informed financial decisions. This didn't happen. As I reviewed the transaction history on his account, I confirmed that whoever he had spoken to previously had only redirected new contributions into stable funds, but had made no change to any existing balance. I told the gentleman that I could review the call, and if our rep had made a mistake, 
adhere to his wishes. I then tried to say something else, but was quickly cut off. Yes, review that call. I want my money out of the market. I tried to say something like, okay, but sir, only to be cut off again. This was not a man with a small account balance. At that time, it was $500,000 plus, meaning that at the beginning of the crisis, he probably had around $1 million in his account. I reviewed the call, and yes, our rep had made a mistake. I went through the process to retroactively conduct his requested transactions. The rep got a negative mark on his record for making a mistake, but the customer really got the short end. For those who don't know, the low point in the market was in early March of that year. Many stocks and markets rebounded enormously and very quickly. What I wanted to tell the guy was something like, Fund A is up 28% since the day you made that call. Fund B is up 32% and so on. But as he didn't give me the chance to tell him to think about his request, well, that is why I am posting here. As my company had to backdate his transactions, he instantly lost about $150,000 in his account and missed out on the boom. Of course, he called later to complain, but even after our mistake, we had done exactly as he had asked. I hope he is enjoying his retirement. OP added an edit on at the bottom. It says, edit for my haters. Let me simplify the situation a bit. In March, dude sees that his balance is around $350,000. A big paper loss from a high of $900,000 or more exactly 18 months earlier. Wants to panic sell. Calls and instructs a rep to transfer to a stable fund. One day removed from the market low. Rep mishandles transaction. A month later, his account is up to 500000 Tells me to review his original request and make sure bad things happen to that rep. Doesn't allow me to explain why this might not be a good idea and ask him to reconsider. Has original request granted and account balance is now back to 350000 Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called SnakeJG. It says, I know a guy who torpedoed his retirement this way. Multiple times he left the market near the bottom and bought back in well into the upswing. Literally always sold low, bought high. I had to double check this guy's username to see if he knew me or not because that's been my experience with the stock market. <laughs> Buy high, everything drops and then you cut your losses to get out before you lose it all. When if you'd stayed in, <laughs> you might be able to retire a couple years earlier. Well, oh well, I guess I'm working until I'm 90. This story comes to us from Taswegian63. Hand over all my tasks so you can get rid of me? Okay. Not sure if this is exactly malicious compliance, but here goes. A few years back, I was the IT contracts and supplier manager at a large company. Been there 25 plus years and had a lot of corporate knowledge, having worked in multiple roles over that time. Also was very well paid due to length of tenure and experience at the company. New butthole boss gets hired and proceeds to get rid of people he doesn't like and hires his buddies into various roles. The workplace culture took a nosedive pretty quickly. I knew my time was limited as I wasn't in his inner circle. Seeing the writing on the wall, I started looking for and applying for other roles. The butthole boss gets me in their sights and decides to get rid of me, looking to move one of his recently hired buddies to my specialized role. He doesn't even understand what I do, needing a lot of technical knowledge combined with contract and legal. He tells me he wants to move me onto an upcoming project and to finish off what I'm currently working on and not take on any new work. Through all my contracts across the company, I knew there was no project or even significant budget for one but I'll do what I'm told. I wrap up my work and tell him I'm ready for the project. He says, sit tight, it's not far away, and don't start anything else. So I sit at my desk, applying for other jobs and waiting. One of the jobs I applied for comes through and I get an offer on a Friday morning. That same afternoon, the butthole boss comes around and says, the project isn't happening, and as you have nothing else on your plate, we will have to let you go. Yahtzee! I knew there is heaps of work backed up and the crap is going to hit the fan soon when contracts aren't renewed 
services cancelled, etc. I also know my employment contract and they will have to pay a generous redundancy because the boss told HR my role isn't required anymore. I say, okay, I guess you will have to pay me a redundancy too. Sure, he says, not knowing what he has agreed to. So I go through the redundancy process and at the same time accept the offer of the new job. Come my last day, I happily accept the $200,000 payout. His face goes pale when he hears of the amount because it comes out of the team's budget. Walk out the door and into the new job the day after. Love my new job, less stress, great culture, a great team. Wish I'd left earlier, but then I wouldn't have gotten the payout if I resigned. Four weeks later, I hear the crap is hitting the fan and they advertise for a new person for my old role as no one knows what to do. Because apparently my job was easy. He didn't even ask me to document what I did to hand over to anyone else. OP added some more context here down in the comment section. It says, some more context for the story. About 10 years ago, I was delivery manager in the IT group and a new CIO came into the company. He spent about two months just watching how things worked, who did what, etc. A very perceptive fellow. After this time, he called me into his office and said, you've got your team humming along, but our contract and procurement processes are stuffed. You know what is going on being one of the longest serving employees. I want you to set up our vendor management office. So I spent six months setting up all the processes, establishing relationships, and getting $20 million per annum portfolio under control. Contract registers, management processes, risk management, the lot. The CIO moved on after about four years, and I kept on in the role until the butthole boss turned up. Because everything was running smoothly, he thought the job must be easy. Let's take a quick look at the contrast between the butthole boss and the CIO. The CIO comes in and spends months watching everything that's going on and seeing how things are done, getting the right people into the right places to run the right teams and get things done. Butthole boss comes in, thinks they know exactly what's going on, that job is easy and my dumb butt friend can do it. <laughs> yep, that's definitely a contrast right there. This story comes to us from Comprehensive Ice 406 Boss says to look pretty. This isn't my story, but my friend's. My friend worked at a jewelry store, and the attire was a business suit. She loves her job because she is surrounded every day by precious metals and stones. She's a nerd for Victorian fashion, or whatever esques there is regarding fashion, balls, princesses, and royalty of Europe. Anyways, the only thing she hates in that job was the manager, Susie. From the account of my friend, Susie has an attitude similar to the fairy godmother from Shrek. Very kind in front of customers, but would then bare her teeth when they left. Her favorite pastime was to chat with the customer while criticizing the employees with remarks about their looks, appearance, or how what accessories they wore didn't match their complexion and such and she seems to have a grudge for my friend. Probably because she engages with the customer with minor trivia like, did you know Jade has a hidden meaning, and such, and it made a lot of people return to the store. One day, Susie came in extremely pissed and started off on my friend about how she looks, mind that she dresses as plainly as possible because she geeks out when it comes to anything fashion related to the 14th century and that she has to look like what the customer wants to look like. I imagine that a light bulb went off on her head and blood rushing to her face as she thought things she could wear and whatnot. So for the entire week, which crosses Valentine's Day, she dressed up in gowns and dresses matched with accessories that made her look like a Barbie princess. The entire time, there were people coming up to her about the dress, the accessories, and the theme to which she explained with delight. Susie was steaming the entire time. She tried to get her fired, but the owner was present because of the upcoming holiday and was happy with the increase in sales then. I managed to sneak by and saw her in a white dress that screamed frozen if it had an Eastern vibe to it, and Susie glaring from the back. I heard she left after the week was over without notice and someone else was promoted. My friend wasn't too bothered 
because the current manager had seniority and was pretty chill, so she's happy. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Spin81. It says, The dumbest thing about this is Susie, a manager, getting mad because someone generates repeat business to their store while doing absolutely nothing wrong. Another commenter called Kiwi Kitten NZ said, What a brilliant way to boost sales around an important date in the jewelry business while maliciously complying with her manager's request. I can see why the owner was happy with this result. Her dressing up because her manager wanted her to look pretty boosted foot traffic into the store, which boosted sales, much to the manager's chagrin. I'm not really sure how malicious this compliance was, but it brought people into the store, so I hope that OP does this in the future. I also hope that the store has some kind of bonus structure so OP can get compensated for bringing all these people in. But I highly doubt it, considering what they said the management sounds like. This story comes to us from Timothy Jor. Malicious compliance through army commands and ensuing chaos and hunger. This is a story from my time in my country's army, Greece. This could also easily be in the petty revenge thread. After I joined the army for my mandatory 9-month service, I was forcibly given the specialty of the cook. After some surprisingly harsh training, they sent me to an outpost where I had to do two daily services, one as a cook and one as an area observer, while everyone else did one to zero services, for about 50 days non-stop. That meant I was on my feet from 6am to 2.30am every single day while getting three and a half hours sleep every night. Nobody helped me in any way. I did not have nearly enough time to prepare the food properly. They claimed it was not protocol to help the cook, and nobody cared. So naturally, I got extremely tired and pissed off. One day, I dared to protest my situation, and also report some problems with the kitchen, lack of supplies, and the oven itself, and was told to shut up, stop complaining, and do my job. So I decided to comply with the shut up and don't complain policy. What they didn't know was that I had found a trick to turn the oven on. It looked fine, but the food wouldn't cook at all. The next day, I was going to prepare a stuffed vegetable dish for 12 people. Tomatoes and peppers stuffed with rice and minced meat. I put it in the oven and waited 4 hours to not be cooked. I casually served the raw food, which had become mushy and rancid, because it was summertime. The look on everyone's face when they tried to eat the first bite was absolutely priceless. They immediately snapped and started freaking out, yelling and screaming in anger like this was a common thing, even though I had never failed a dish before. And those arrogant selfish pricks ate like kings every day. I maliciously smiled and told them that I lacked half of my supplies and the recipe was wildly incomplete while the oven was malfunctioning. Word reached the captain, who also freaked out, but I told him that it was he who commanded me to shut up about the food problems. He said my failure should be reported, and I agreed. I immediately called my unit and reported that I was being mistreated, overworked, sleepless, and ignored for 43 consecutive days. So this resulted to my failure. The next day, I heard the captain was reprimanded severely by our colonel commander for the crappy situation in his outpost. Of course, the next three days I did the exact same thing, and I starved the bastards to insanity. Afterwards, they were begging me to help out with the food preparations, but I refused since I complied with it's not protocol to help the cook policy, which they claimed in the first place, and kept feeding them disgusting, tasteless food under the excuse of a broken oven. They called the unit and cried that I'm holding them hostage with the food and I should be removed. The day I was removed one week later was the best day of my life. I haven't regretted anything and 100% would do it again. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Teapots at 10 Paces. It says, never ever F with the cook. Why do people like learning this lesson the hard way? Another commenter down below called Shroomy Smurf said, Good on you. One would think that after the first meal, things would have been fixed. Oh well, sucks for them. 
OP responded to this one and said, sadly, it didn't because they didn't give a crap about me or my hard work. Everyone else had an 8-hour service day for 2-hour shifts, and I had continuous 21-hour shifts every day for 50 days. They didn't learn the first time because they're used to me getting effed constantly, and even made jokes about it. You should see them on the third day. It was glorious. They were so angry and frustrated, some of them nearly cried, and their faces were pale. Oof, it's been 10 years and still feel great about it. The list of people that you really shouldn't mess with is getting longer and longer. We don't mess with IT, we don't mess with cooks, we don't mess with medics, and what do you guys think? Anybody else you could add to that list? Make sure you put it in the comments section down below. And if you're listening on the podcast, well, <laughs> go over to YouTube and comment down below. This story comes to us from WorldlyLeg74. Usernames must follow district education policies. At my first job decades ago as the junior employee on the IT staff for a school, I was in charge of setting up email addresses for new teachers. The district had Microsoft Exchange for email, and the education policy was that all teacher email addresses would follow the same format, first initial, then last name, unless we had another teacher of the same name, which never happened because we only had 400 teachers in the district. However, we did have a new teacher, Greg Roper, who I decided to just set up simply as Roper G. Once all the new usernames were set up, my boss, our bureaucratic assistant principal, reviewed them all and sent me a short note, telling me to fix Greg's username to comply with the school's standard format. Well, I didn't see the note until my next workday, and by that time, principal's assistant had left for a vacation to Hawaii. Facing a deadline to publish all the emails for the school's website and back-to-school email, I went ahead and followed orders. Username changed to Groper. Email set to Groper at WashingtonUnified.org. Pushed to production. And everything was quiet for about a week. But then students began to receive their welcome emails, directing them to contact their teachers using the newly assigned email addresses. Next thing I knew, I got an urgent, slightly flustered call from the principal himself. I printed off that email directive from the assistant principal and went up to the principal's office, where I found both of them sitting side by side. Apparently, several concerned parents had already contacted the school, questioning the appropriateness of the teacher's email address. The assistant principal, still tan from his vacation, started to low-key chastise me for not catching this sooner. Well, his sunburned face turned even redder from embarrassment when I plopped down the email thread from a week earlier where he explicitly asked me to make Greg's email comply with the school policy. The principal's expression was priceless. The assistant principal left with his tail between his legs, and I had a new email, Roper G, created for the teacher that afternoon. Greg was so grateful that he actually took me to lunch, joking that it was the least he could do after the crazy ordeal. Quick edit at the bottom, OP wanted to note that the school name has been changed so that email address that I read above doesn't go anywhere. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Grumpy Cat Stevens. It says, My own company had to make an exception to our email username convention for a fellow by the last name of Watts because his first name began with a T. They decided to include his middle initial. The whole comment section on this story is a gold mine of crazy usernames that people have seen in the past. But the one that takes the cake out of all of them, Megan Finger. Because her email address was her last name Finger and the first two letters of her first name. This story comes to us from She's Out Raised by Wolves. Required to make time for something the higher ups wanted, so I used it for overtime. My department heads recently suggested that employees shadow doctors in the department in order to learn more about workflow and reasoning in treatment and care and diagnoses. However, they put it entirely on the staff to set up when they would come in and shadow. Any attempts to get the higher-ups to work with us on setting up a schedule fell on deaf ears, and the resolution we got was to come in on an off day to volunteer. Uh, no. Well, I had double night shift overtime coming up with a lot of off days afterwards, so I decided to shadow on my last shift. 
I ended up shadowing for most of a full day shift before getting checked off to go home. Later in the week, I get a call from the department manager in shambles that I did that much overtime. When I told them it was never made clear if we were to clock out or not for shadowing and that emails never got answered, I said I couldn't be blamed. The conversation ended quickly and later, a schedule was set up so that employees could shadow on their shift. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called WDJM. It says, if it is required, then it is required to be paid. They cannot require you to volunteer. That's literally illegal, at least in the USA. But good job enforcing that in the most satisfying way possible. I've never really understood why people in the medical field put in so many hours. You'd think if somebody's been working for that long and they're extremely tired, that mistakes would start to be made. Hmm, maybe somebody can explain to me why they do that? Comment down below. And if you're listening on the podcast, well, jump on over to YouTube at KCC and comment down below. This story comes to us from Zealous Ideal Ad 7045. We have standard operating procedures, we will be fine. Worked for a big company in record retention department years ago. Lots of microfilm and starting to image documents electronically. Due to restructuring, butthead of a supervisor who couldn't even operate a photocopier took over our one shift the company didn't eliminate. The older 25 plus year employees I learned my job from retired, moved on or got let go. Because of this, I was the only one who knew the nuances of the job. I had two huge binders with all the notes and cheats on how to find stuff. Things like, if computer says file is in drawer 2A13 under the date, look in drawer B7008 instead. When I gave my notice, I said to the supervisor, I'll be glad to sit down with him and go through the book and point out a few important things. He never did. Right before I left, I said, I have my binders. Are you sure you don't want to take a few minutes today? No, he said. We have standard operating procedures for guidance. I could get rid of the binders. So I did. I shredded them. A few months after I left, he calls me. I already knew what he wanted because an ex-coworker already called me. He was panicking because a few big contracts were requesting old files and they were having trouble. Where did I put the cheat binder mentioned in that standard operating procedure he was trying to figure out? I laughed and said, you told me to get rid of them. You have standard operating procedures. He then asked if I could return as a contractor. I said, sure, $500 an hour when I was making 12. They didn't go for it. Instead, they lost millions and moved the files to corporate instead of a satellite office. Supervisor was let go. They were going to close that department anyway, but accelerated it. Everyone transferred to different departments or got nice severance. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called JLF Roger. It says, we hear so much about, don't give too much effort to a company. You're dispensable and easily replaced. But then we hear stories like this and know there's some balance in the world. For a lot of these people, easily replaced means being replaced by a team of like three to five people to do the job that one person did previously. Companies really need to protect their senior employees, you know, the ones that know what's going on and have been running the company for years. This story comes to us from Pitted Cherries. Boss wants paper reports? Sure thing. At my job, my boss had a peculiar insistence on having all reports printed out and physically filed in a cabinet, despite our office having a well-established digital filing system that made accessing and storing documents a breeze, he was adamant that physical copies were the way to go. So I dutifully complied with his request. I spent countless hours printing out reports, hole punching them, and meticulously organizing them in the filing cabinet. The cabinet quickly filled up with stacks of paper, taking up valuable office space and making it difficult to locate specific documents. Months passed and my boss finally realized the absurdity and inefficiency of his mandate. He sheepishly admitted that he had not considered the environmental impact or the wasted time and resources involved in his paper pushing obsession. From then on, we embraced the digital filing system wholeheartedly and I never had to hole punch a report again. My malicious compliance 
had finally paid off. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Tyke1959. It says, I remember reading in a computer industry newspaper that the paperless office was less than two years away. That was in 1982. This reminds me of my insurance company that whenever I make an update to my account, they send me out my new insurance slips. But in that same envelope is another full piece of paper reminding me that they went paperless. It happens every single time. This story comes to us from Ask Angie, insurance for newborn. I had a baby in early February and the plan originally was to put him on my BF's VA insurance, but apparently we can't do that because he's a veteran and veteran insurance doesn't allow dependents. Weird, but okay, we'll add him to mine. I messaged our HRD and they informed me that they would need a copy of his birth certificate within 30 days of his birth. The problem with that is we can't even request a copy of the birth certificate until four weeks after he's born, and then we have to wait for the copy to come in the mail. I asked HRD if the affidavit of parentage form would suffice since it's notarized and they said no. So I asked what happens if I don't get the birth certificate within 30 days and they advised we would have to wait until open enrollment, which has already passed for this year. So basically, my newborn would have no insurance for almost a year, and we would have to pay thousands for his birth and appointments. I was doing some research, and apparently my son qualifies for Medicaid because I was on pregnancy Medicaid, and I never would have known had my HRD not denied my request. So now, his insurance is free, and my employer is out over $200 a month. I've been getting emails from HRD asking if we got the birth certificate yet, even though it's past the 30 days. Too late. Thanks for not caring about your employees at all. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called SpiritualCatch6757. It says, That's silly. I don't know what your HR is doing, but my HR said the birth certificate from the hospital that you get the day after birth will suffice temporarily. I didn't even get the birth certificate in the mail until some 60 plus days after, and I had to go in person to get it. OP responded and said, they said, you can pick up a copy at insert county's name courthouse, but he wasn't born in the county that I work and they gave me instructions for how to get it. So silly. OP, in this case, I would be making an absolute stink with your boss because if their policy is to not insure kids, without a birth certificate issued within 30 days, they're basically refusing to insure any kids. And that's probably illegal, but I'm not from the USA, so I don't know. This story comes to us from FunPin9061. Boss demands overtime pay for zero work? Okay. So this happened a while back, but the memory still brings a smirk to my face whenever I think about it. I used to work for a company where the boss had this habit of demanding that we stay late, even when there was absolutely no work left to be done. It was one of those toxic environments where productivity was measured by the hours you spent at your desk rather than the actual output of your work. One day, after wrapping up all my tasks well before the end of the day, my boss came over and told me that I needed to stay late because that's just how things are done around here. Mind you, there was literally nothing left for me to do. Now, instead of arguing or trying to reason with him, I decided to play along with his ridiculous demand for overtime pay. I nodded, grabbed a book I had been meaning to read, and settled back into my chair. For the next two hours, I sat at my desk, flipping through pages, occasionally pretending to jot down notes, and looking as busy as possible. At the end of those two hours, my boss came by to check on me, expecting to see me toiling away at some imaginary task. Instead, he found me reading a novel. He looked puzzled and asked, What are you doing? With a straight face, I replied, Well, you asked me to stay late, so I figured I might as well put in some overtime. This book has been on my reading list for a while. Needless to say, my boss was speechless. He couldn't really argue with me since he had asked me to stay late, and I was technically still on the clock. From that day forward, he never asked me to stay late unless there was actual work to be done. Malicious compliance at its finest. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Bestest Beekeeper. It says, 
See, this is a wasted opportunity in my opinion, because you only got that one day. As a gamer, this is the dream. Alt-Tab is my best friend, and my boss would think I'm slaving away with how I'm sweating at my desk. I'll stay late every day, boss. I got you. If they're telling you to stay late and put in overtime and they're not checking up on what you're doing, that's completely on them. I say get that money and enjoy your book or your gaming, whatever works. This story comes to us from Audi Duty. 10 words or less? Okay. Working as an auto tech in a woman-owned repair shop, I was once asked to explain the problem with a female customer's car to them. I am pretty good at explaining things without using jargon, and usually had no problems doing this, but not with this customer. I started to explain what was going on, but she decided that I was out to bamboozle her. She shoved her hand, palm out, to within an inch of my face and stated loudly, Stop! I did so, and she said in a very arch tone, I want you to tell me in 10 words or less what is wrong with my car. I shrugged and said, it's broken, repairs will cost $700, and walked away. She followed saying, I guess I need more information than that. I replied, that is what I was trying to provide before you so rudely interrupted me. Now, if you will excuse me, I have other work to do. Then, I refused to respond to her in any way. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called KatePig123. It says, this reminds me of the saying, I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you. Another commenter called 626337 said, Did she turn Karen and complain to your manager? Opie responded and said, Of course. Manager went off on me, but I told her, I thought explaining things to the customer was your job. Oh, so this one is actually a double malicious compliance. That hand shoving right in your face and saying stop, is one of the most rude things that a person can do, and I wouldn't want to work with them either. You're right, you have a manager. Let them deal with Karen. This story comes to us from Gabriel Jack, Cheese Making Antics. My dad is far from being stupid. Actually, I'd say he is one of the smartest people I know, but even the smartest people have some really, really stupid moments. You see, my dad owns a farm, and his late brother, my uncle, owned the neighboring farm and used to raise cattle. My dad constantly bought milk from my uncle in pretty big quantities to make cheese. Usually, the workers of my uncle's farm would bring us the milk to our farm since it was nearby. But one time, one time, my dad went to my uncle's farm with me on a big five-seater pickup truck he had borrowed from my uncle. That day, he decided he would bring the milk home by himself in buckets. Open buckets. He ordered me, despite me trying to say otherwise, to sit in the middle of the back seat with one bucket of milk on either side and told me to hold them tightly. I tried to explain again why I thought it was a really bad idea, but he was adamant in not listening and ordered me to comply. So I shut up and did. I sat down in the middle of the back seat, one bucket in each side, silently, not saying anything anymore, holding the buckets so that they wouldn't move an inch. As soon as we closed the door, he turned on the pickup and the car started to move. It was like a tsunami of milk splashing on the whole interior of the car. As he realized what happened and that I had no fault in it whatsoever as I had no way to control the milk and I had tried to warn him, I never saw him more embarrassed. The car smelled like spoiled milk for months and my dad had to swap cars with my uncle on a semi-permanent basis until the smell disappeared even after several cleanings. From time to time, I bring it up and he still is embarrassed as that is one of the few times he has no explanation on why he did something so stupid. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Algae888. It says, probably could have avoided most of the smell by instantly running a hose onto the back seat area and flushing all traces of the milk away, then running fans to wick away as much moisture as possible. OP responded and said, we tried. Issue was, it was not just the back seat area. Milk got everywhere. The seats, the front of the car, under the mats, doors, 
everything. Even the ceiling of the car had milk dripping from it. The road in my uncle's farm was not only unpaved, it was very bumpy, and the car was pretty potent. So when my dad accelerated, the car immediately hit a hole in the ground, and it took him a few seconds before he knew anything was wrong. So the car had some speed. And then, when he stepped on the brakes, that was like a second even bigger wave. That is why I said there was milk everywhere. Yep, when transporting milk in buckets, you don't skim on the lids needed for the buckets. You have a 1% to 2% chance of making it back without spilling any. <laughs> I think we'll just leave it at that. This story comes to us from WJB7694. Don't order items not on the menu. A long time ago, I was waiting tables at lunch in a decent restaurant. We had iced tea that we brewed each morning, and it was slightly orange flavored, and this was on the menu as well as hot tea. For hot tea, we had an assorted variety of celestial seasonings. A table of two women came in, and one ordered iced tea, but one of the celestial seasoning flavors. I explained that we only have one type of iced tea made, and the others were listed under hot tea. I also explained to her that this is not something we are supposed to do, and it messes us up, because people expect free refills like it is the regular iced tea. She was not nice, and was unhappy that I would not go out of my way to make her what she wanted. We were reasonably busy, and this was not something we were supposed to do. I don't know where the manager was, or if I was new to waiting tables, and did not think to get the manager to talk to them. In a fairly bitchy tone, she said she would go around our rules by ordering the hot tea and a glass of ice and do it herself. I went to the wait station and filled a glass with ice and put it in the ice bin to chill, got a mug of water, and microwaved it to boiling. I then brought the mug, the tea bag, the glass of ice, and a straw to her table. About five minutes later, I was taking an order from another table, and the two women were frantically waving me down. As I expected, the hot tea hit the cold glass, cracking the glass and dumping all the tea on the table. I tried to sound stupid when I said, maybe that's why we aren't supposed to do that, as I cleaned up the mess. She never did get to drink any tea. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Raised on a Diet. It says, you microwaved the water and brought the bag to the table? OP responded and said, that restaurant would have a little basket with different types of tea and the bags were sealed up in a paper wrapper. When someone ordered, the basket was brought to the table and they picked what they liked. We did not sell much tea. I think I sold three hot teas in a year working there. I really hope there's not a whole lot of British people listening to this one because microwaving the water for a tea? That's blasphemy. I'm actually kind of surprised that OP went this way on this one, because that glass shattering could have caused injuries, and that would have been completely on OP. This story comes to us from Anonymous0212. Make me stay home so I can water all the plants? Fine, I will water all the plants. I don't remember the exact circumstances now, because this was back when I was a resentful, hormonal teenager half a century or so ago. F I'm old. I think my mother was going shopping, and I wanted to go with her, but she told me I had to stay home and do chores, including watering all the plants. I apparently didn't immediately react in a polite enough manner, so she reiterated in a louder voice, you need to water all the plants. So I did including her precious roses in the backyard, in the middle of winter. When she got home and let the dog out and noticed water-related evidence in the backyard that should not have been there, she started shrieking at me. What did I do? How could I be so stupid? Was I trying to kill her roses? Etc. And I just looked her straight in the eye and said, Well, you did tell me to water all the plants. OP added a quick edit down at the bottom, it says, and no, the roses did not die because it didn't get cold enough that night. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called DCLXBI616. It says, and then she got on the rotary telephone and called at least three of her friends to complain about what you did. OP responded and said, she was, and still is, extraordinarily private. 
a never air your dirty laundry in public type person. But honestly, I think mainly because she's needed people to see her as being the best, the smartest, etc. So there can't be any cracks in that facade. So many people in the comment section on this one going off on OP for being a horrible kid, but this is just a teenager, come on. Tell me you never did anything petty when you were a teenager. I mean, she's lucky you just watered the roses because they're perfectly fine. They can stand the cold temperatures. I probably would have peed on them. This story comes to us from Bailey the Nerd. Dryer finds are mine, eight-year-old versus dad. In eons past, I was once a youth. Growing up, my parents were pretty big on teaching their best and only child how to do things himself. This, in parent speak, meant that I was taught chores very young. I have been helping do laundry, dishes, the lawn, and cleaning since early elementary school. We all took care of the laundry, doing everyone else's along with ours when needed. So there were rules in place. Any change found in the dryer became the property of the person unloading the dryer. Eight-year-old Bailey was extremely distraught one day to find that my fortune of 10 whole dollars had gone through the wash and was claimed out of the dryer by my dad. I was furious. I demanded back the $10, but my lovely dad reminded me of the rules. It was his to keep fair game. At this point, I decided that I would be the only person to unload the dryer. My parents were very pleasantly surprised that for months, they never had to pull out the clothes and start the folding process since I just grabbed the laundry and fold while binging Cartoon Network. Eventually, what started as a desperate attempt to guard my various petty treasures gave way to the perfect opportunity for malicious compliance. You see, this was the very early 2000s. My dad wasn't yet keen on keeping all his cash on cards, so he kept most of his money in cash. On this particular day, he left $200 in his pocket, and doing the laundry meant that it was mine. All mine. I silently stuffed the cash in my tiny coin bank in my room, pleased with my lucrative haul. Eventually, my dad discovered that he was short a large sum of money and tore apart his office and bedroom looking for it, before he recalled that he had left it in his jeans pocket. Despite my subtlety, I was quickly confronted. The rule was rescinded, and I was only allowed to keep $50. But again, to an 8-year-old, this was a king's ransom. I had emerged mostly victorious. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Patty Cake. It says, Your dad should have taken the lesson and let you keep it all. Totally unfair. I'm glad you at least got more than your $10 back. And I hope you stopped unloading the dryer now that the rule was gone. Another commenter down below called TechNot said, Don't you love it when those responsible for your training in society teach you that you can't trust authority because they'll change the rules on you to support their own agenda. Rules for thee, not for me. OP responded to this one and said, He did impress that lesson. He also taught me it's harder to change written rules on the fly, and I am now a master of cover your butt. OP, I think you should remind your dad of those $10 that he took from you previously, remember you were furious about it, and tell him, well, if we use the same ratio of what I get to keep out of what I found, then you owe me $7.50 back on my $10. It's only fair, dad, because you're the one that changed the rules. This story comes to us from Big Coconuts. <laughs> wedding Snackdown. I was attending my cousin's daughter's wedding. There was a snack bar at the entry area, and lots of guests were congregating there, eating and chatting. Few people were getting through to the seating area, so my cousin asked me to get the snack bar shut down. I went there and told the people there to close it down. They said they would do it immediately after serving the people waiting. Okay. I headed back and told my cousin it would be closed in a couple of minutes. He's worried and says, No, I meant immediately. They have to shut down immediately. Alrighty then. I went back to them. They had already shut down. I went back and told my cousin with a straight face. There were four people there. I knocked the plates out of their hands and told them to walk inside. I told them you told me to do it. Shocked Pikachu face. 
My cousin is a great guy, but he does get a bit worked up sometimes over the small stuff. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Gosh Doodly Do. It says, that's hilarious. Hopefully he settled down after that story, but he might not ask you to do something in the future, so it's a win-win. OP responded to this one and said, after some time, he realized that I was kidding, but those few seconds were precious. I don't get why they couldn't have just made an announcement. I'm assuming they had a DJ or a PA system or something there. They could have just said, okay, people, let's move along. We've got a bottleneck and people can't get inside. Really easy to make an announcement. I do like the way that OP handled this one, though. It would put a lot more stress on them on that big day. <laughs> oh, why not? This story comes to us from Sella Life. Extra, extra caramel. I was at coffee shop and yesterday was one I will forever be grateful to my manager for. A customer came through ordering a blended beverage. Said beverage was modified to the point of being not even remotely what the original drink was. Can I also preface this by saying that the drink was ordered at drive through with the child screaming into the headphones the whole time and the customer did nothing to calm the child, just spoke louder. So when customer drives up, the drink with multiple modifications was missing one. It was a topping that was easily added on top, but the customer wanted the whole drink remade. Why, I asked, as we had a line and I had more drinks to get to. The answer was, it didn't have enough caramel drizzle. Now, the drink doesn't come with caramel drizzle, it was ordered with extra caramel, and I did put a ton on the top as well as put caramel around the cup, which is already extra. I was told they wanted extra extra, so I coated the inside of the new cup. The caramel was so thick you couldn't see the drink. I also added a quarter inch to the bottom just in case, and added extra of the other toppings requested and gave half a container of it on the side per my manager's instruction. Now, this was my third to final drink I made because it was my day off and I came in to help, and the time I agreed to stay to was past, and the second time I agreed to stay to was also past. I was doing one last task of wiping down the cafe and clocking out. In comes the customer. Customer is so angry. Because customer said they didn't deserve to have an employee get mad and fill their cup with half syrup. Manager tells them, well, what did you want? You got extra caramel, it wasn't enough, and you got extra extra, and it was too much. You're gonna have to explain what you are wanting. I love my manager. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Throwaway Old Guy. It says, I would really like to see more businesses start firing customers that pull these kinds of stunts. Here's the menu, no substitutions, no ifs, ands, or buts. Another commenter down below called Duffel Bag Pete said, Managers should tell them they refuse service to that customer at this location permanently. OP responded and said, I loved my manager's response, it was perfect. Manager has fired a customer before for foul language so it's not unheard of at my store. The customer literally caused a stink in the drive-thru holding up other customers because they wanted extra extra caramel, and then when they got it, they came in to complain. Yep, that's a customer you could fire. But you know corporate won't see it that way because you make that customer happy this once and they'll keep coming back and spending money at your store, even though they're a giant douchebag about it. It's kind of a lose-lose situation. This story comes to us from Imaginary Weird 6027 Oh, you want it spicy? We had a regular guest that came into a restaurant I used to work at every day. Every day, he complained that his dish was not spicy enough, and every day, we remade it the same way and gave it to him. I had enough and invested in some ghost pepper sauce. Next day, dude comes in, we make his order, it is not hot enough. So I remake his order myself and use the entire bottle of ghost pepper sauce in it. We pointed and giggled as we watched him turn 40 shades of red while he ate. He was clearly suffering and finally admitted defeat and did not finish his meal. Be careful what you ask for. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called No Crimps. It says, 
So the guest wants a dish spicier and you continue making it the same spice level every day? Sounds like you are bad at your job. I kind of have the same point to make on this one as I did on the last one. This was a regular customer and they had a pretty normal request about making their food spicier. And then OP went and did the whole ghost pepper thing, which by the way, could have severely injured the customer. I don't know, I don't feel like this one is a win. I feel like OP was a bit of a dick. <laughs> what do you all think on this one? Comment down below. And if you're listening on the podcast, well, go on to YouTube at KCC and comment down below. This story comes to us from Brew3017. A friend charged a tow fee because he wouldn't trust my automotive knowledge. Back in the early 2000s, my friend and I were at a bowling alley. As we went out to leave, he couldn't get his car started. I asked if he wanted me to look at it since I have been working on cars since I was 14. And he said no, that he knows as much if not more about cars than I do. So the tow truck arrived, they asked me to steer as they pushed it out of the parking spot. I got in, put it in park, started the vehicle, backed it out, and asked the tow truck driver if he wanted me to drive it onto his flatbed or if he wanted to pull it up. Everyone, including the tow truck driver, burst out in laughter. My friend was livid. Why didn't you tell me that was the problem? I said, you told me you were more experienced than me and didn't need my help. From then on, he never doubted my automotive knowledge. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Barely Lethal 10 It says, it took me two reads to figure out what even happened. I felt dumb, but not nearly as dumb as your friend must have. Okay, let's be honest here. I had to read this one a couple times myself to figure out what happened, and I was a tow truck driver at one point. But then you find out that the car just wasn't in park, and it needed to be in order to be started. This story comes to us from Used Register 3714. You can't remember? Pay me to remind you. Not sure if this is the right place, but also new to Reddit, but I needed to vent. Sorry for the wall of text. My manager oversees 16-ish people. Completely forgot that I had PTO one morning last week. We had spoken about it the day before too, because I had to change the time of my doctor's appointment. The morning of my appointment, I wasn't going to clock in till I got back. However, when I got back, I found out that he had assigned me to cover part of someone's shift, call center, because they were out sick. I had him asking in our group chat for me to call him and also DMing me in the same chat we used to discuss the time of my appointment changing for where I was. The person who oversees that the phones are covered messaging me telling me I was to be on the phones and my manager's boss texting me asking where I was. I finally called my manager, video call, and I recorded that too, and reminded him that we had spoken about the time of my appointment being in the morning. He then asked me to text him reminders every time I have PTO now. Well, he's about to learn. I have two more days coming up in April, and I will clock in for 15 minutes each day to send that reminder text. If I have to do his job of reminding him I am off, when there are multiple ways for him to remember, then they can pay me. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Borp ABC. It says, he plays stupid, act like he's stupid. Every time from now on when you get PTO or anything, use the occasion to explain to your boss what a calendar is, how it works, and gasp, they have those online now. OP, depending on where you live, you might actually be able to get three hours of pay every time you do something work-related that your boss has told you to do when you're not scheduled on shift. That's how it works here in Ontario, Canada, but I'm not sure about other places. This story comes to us from Vextail Brook. I did as they asked, so what's the issue? I was five years old when my mom went into the store, in which before she left she told me not to unlock the door nor open it for anyone. I waited for her to get back by playing with my cat named Snuggles McCuddles Fluffy Pants for I forget how long. In turn, when mom returned from the store, I continued playing with my cat, completely ignoring my mom each time she asked me, can you please unlock and open the door because she left the key to our house in the kitchen. 
which she was getting really extremely mad while shouting at me, just unlock and open the door already, else I'll effing ground you, until my sister, 12 years at the time, had unlocked the door for mom. Then, a few minutes after, my mom calmed down, she asked me, why didn't you unlock and open the door for me when I asked you to? In which, that's when I simply stated, with a sweet little smile on my child face, well, you said to not unlock the door nor open it for anyone, and that's what I did, mom. Resulting in my stepdad snickering at this, all the while, my mom just stood there speechless, as if trying to process what I'd said. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Rashu. It says, So sister and stepdad were home, but didn't open the door either? Okay, commenter, I mean, come on. Didn't you hear the way that she was shouting at them to open the door? I think they were just playing it up as long as they could. Besides, with an attitude like that, would you want to let her in? <laughs> this story comes to us from ActiveAd5869. Company wants us to bring our own workwear? Any logo? I work for a courier company which hires employees as independent contractors to skimp out on paying tax and benefits. I work diligently, but I lost any goodwill towards them for the aforementioned reasons. They also require us to wear high-vis clothing while delivering. We pride ourselves on next day delivery. One courier can deliver up to 50 different businesses in one day. The way deliveries work is that the sender hires us to deliver to the receiver. The receiver has no clue which company was hired to deliver it to them. The only way the receiver would know would be by looking at our uniform. I live in an area where it frequently gets cold and windy. I have a waterproof high-vis jacket, but there's one catch. It has my old company's logo on it. As I already lost all goodwill towards my current employer, I just wore that. I have been delivering for my current company for the past three years, and in that time, I've had countless receivers remark on how good and speedy my company is. I've even seen a few reviews for my old company from business clients I've delivered to in the capacity of my current employer. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called AJ Clements. It says, well, since you don't actually work for them anyway, start your own company and get a jacket with your company's name and logo. Build goodwill against that name. When enough reputation is built up, change from a subcontractor to a full-on competitor. Hire all your coworkers just for extra fun and actually hire them. You know, this is actually a really good idea to get a business off of the ground. If the company doesn't care what logo's on your jacket, then definitely set up your own. It's a really quick way to build credibility, and you're doing that job already. Build up some money, get your own trucks, start your own company, you'll already have a reputation. That is perfect OP, and you should get right on that. This story comes to us from Quigley. We're not allowed to say it. Okay. Years ago, I worked in the prep kitchen for a small chain of restaurants. For background, when you pick up a knife in a restaurant kitchen, you're supposed to say sharp pretty loudly, so that other people rushing around know someone is walking around with a knife. Anyway, we had two kinds of knives, large chef knives and paring knives. There were only a few paring knives, not enough for everyone to have one at their station. At some point, one of my coworkers started referring to the knives as sharps, and so I started calling the paring knives baby sharps, and it caught on. This led to people across the room asking, who's got a baby sharp? Now my boss was a massive bee. She, for some reason unknown, didn't like us calling the paring knives baby sharps, and said so on a few occasions, but nobody cared. To be clear, nobody ever said or sang baby sharp do 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 or anything like that. Well, one day, she was in a particularly bad mood and yelled at us, Nobody is allowed to say baby sharp anymore. Cue malicious compliance. That afternoon, I went home and photoshopped a little cartoon face, bonnet, pacifier, and diaper onto an image of a paring knife. I took the image to a custom print shop and had them print it onto a baseball cap. We were required to wear hats at work to keep stray hairs from falling into the food. I only worked there a couple months after this because I found a better job, but you better believe I wore that baby sharp hat to work the next day. 
and then every day for the remainder of my time there. The boss never said anything to me about it, but I know it pissed her off. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, we have one from a user called Squid52. It says, Once my toddler started crying and yelling, My shirt! My shirt! Anyhow, it turns out he wanted in the knife drawer and was mad I'd locked it. I guess I always said no sharp, so he called knives sharts for about a year. In case you need an alternative word to use. Oh no. Oh no. Baby shark poo 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 poo. This story comes to us from You Messed Up 12. New boss destroys everything for everyone. I worked for this tech company for almost seven years. It was my first job out of college. Great company, huge growth, great benefits, and most importantly, an incredible boss. The boss was super helpful and responsive, always had the team's back, goes out of his way to not micromanage, didn't care as long as the work got done, borderline forced people to take PTO, we have unlimited, and I average 30 to 40 days off a year, and believed in giving good workers big raises and promotions. Last three years, I got 9%, 13% and a promotion, and 7% raises. We worked remote through COVID, and I asked to change my contract to fully remote so I could leave the H Call City where the office was based to go back to my hometown. Boss approved the change, and when HR tried to do a call adjustment to my salary, Boss told them no because I'll be doing the same work in my new location. The boss was so good that on our team of 16 people, the lowest tenured was three and a half years. I'd been offered several other jobs with salary increases throughout the years, but could never bring myself to leave. Myself and one other person on my team had specialized into working on very complex and involved projects. These were significantly different than the team's normal day-to-day -day work. We'd been doing the complex projects for four plus years and were the knowledge base for the company in that area. Boss left that area completely to us to manage. As the volume picked up, we added and trained two more people to our little sub-team to help out. None of these projects went out to the customers without one of us four being involved. Super complex, hundred thousands to millions lost if a mistake was made. And since it was the fastest growing part of the business, by far, we were super busy. Now, around two years ago, Boss's boss gets promoted from his VP role up to an SVP spot and hires a new VP. This new VP comes in and tries to change a lot very quickly. Tries to make everything a trackable metric, even where it really doesn't make sense. Tracking the number of projects each person on my team did every month. Counted as one, even if it was super complex and took two weeks, or if it was very simple with an existing customer and took an hour. Wanted each project to go out faster, even if they weren't due for a week, we were supposed to get them out in under three days. Tried to force my boss to assign work to the team instead of us all picking up from a central queue as we could, etc, etc. Boss pushed back as much as possible, but was getting crapped on constantly by new VP because the useless metrics VP wanted us tracked by did not meet his super unrealistic expectations. Despite my boss's team being the most experienced and efficient in the company, and doing significantly more volume and more complex work than any other team. About nine months ago, Boss had enough of just getting consistently crapped on by VP and took a new job and left. Boss had been with the company for 13 years and was one of the first few 100 employees. My whole team was devastated. We all instantly started lobbying for the most tenured person on our team to get promoted into that role as she would have the same philosophy as the boss that just left. VP interviews most tenured and a bunch of external candidates, and goes with someone from his previous company. Now, this lady will be referred to as Bitch Boss from here on out for soon to be obvious reasons. She came in and completely destroyed the team from top to bottom, changed processes that had been perfected for years, did not listen or care about what anyone else had to say, started micromanaging to the extreme, Team morale dropped like a rock. It took less than a month for the team's output to crater due to all of her changes. The team went from best in the company to the worst. It took Bitch Boss about two months to get to my smaller sub team and try to rework our processes. Bitch Boss started micromanaging projects, having no idea what she's doing and causing all kinds of issues and delays. 
she started getting on us for about our metrics being the worst on the team, despite us working on the super complex projects that took 10 to 100 times longer on average than most of the work the rest of the team did. Bitch Boss told us that if we didn't meet the expected metrics, we would be put on performance improvement plans. So we decided to comply and focused all of our efforts on simple projects to meet the metric, X number of projects completed per month per person, and left the complex ones sitting in the queue. This caused chaos. Very quickly, the sales team is freaking out because deals are getting delayed and their huge commission checks from the complex projects are being put in jeopardy. When they came to us to ask when we were going to complete the complex projects, we all gave the same response. Bitch Boss has told us to focus all of our efforts on meeting Metric X, so we will only be doing that. Unfortunately, that means we can no longer complete the complex projects. Please contact Bitch Boss for help in getting them completed. This did not go over well with her or VP, as he started to get complaints as well. They called a meeting and told us we had to go back to doing the complex projects. We refused, as that made it impossible to meet the metrics they created to measure our performance. They refused to drop the metric, but still insisted we work on the complex ones as we were the only ones with the knowledge. We still refused. This resulted in a lot more complaints from sales until the SVP got involved. The SVP was the one who created the complex sub-team to begin with and sided with us against the VP and Bitch Boss. He said we were not to be measured by the metrics and can go back to managing the complex stuff without fear of being put on a performance improvement plan. So we did. At this point, the other three people on the sub team had seen the writing on the wall and were all actively applying and trying to leave ASAP. They were all office based in the age call area still. Bitch Boss changed the team from come in one to two days a week as needed to mandatory three days in the office. Most company policy would let her. So they got a lot more of her BS than I did remote. I had not been applying because I was distracted. My old boss had approved two weeks of vacation for my wedding and honeymoon before he left. This happened to occur about three months after Bitch Boss started, and about a month after the whole performance improvement plan blow up. Bitch Boss was pissed at how we showed her up in front of the SVP and was doing everything she could to make our lives miserable. In that month, the other super experienced guy and my best friend on the sub team got a new job and left, no notice, and one of the other guys on the sub team has put in his notice and only had a week left. We were already slammed and still behind from the performance improvement plan fiasco, so losing half the sub team just made that worse. Plus, with morale so low, we didn't bother to put in any extra effort anymore. In fact, the whole team was significantly behind as 6 of the 16 people had left or were on their notice periods at that point. So Bitch Boss decided that she was cancelling my already approved wedding leave because of how far the team was behind. She told me over Zoom. I told her there was no chance I'm missing my wedding and honeymoon for work and I'm taking the full leave and it's up to her if she wants to lose another person from the sub team for two weeks or permanently. She BS'd, yelled, and threatened until I just left the Zoom call. She followed up with an email officially notifying me my leave was cancelled, and if I didn't show up, it would be considered job abandonment. I called her bluff and replied, CCing VP and SVP and some other sales VPs who I worked with regularly, explaining the situation. It's my wedding honeymoon and that I appreciated the opportunity but was quitting immediately with no notice due to the disrespect from Bitch Boss. I got Slack messages from SVP and several of the sales VPs almost immediately asking me not to quit. The email chain itself blew up with complaints about how my team was mismanaged by Bitch Boss and how now more complex deals were going to get lost because I wouldn't be there at all to work on them, etc. SBP eventually shut it down, but it was a fun read. I didn't reply to the Slack messages or do any work the rest of that day, just turned everything off and went to a bar and had a good time. I woke up the next day late in the morning and very hungover to a few voicemails on my phone from SVP asking me to call him. I called back in the early afternoon and talked to the SVP. He was very understanding, 
asked me to come back, listened to all my complaints, and eventually made an offer. Basically, if I came back and worked the rest of the week and tried to train a few team members to work on complex stuff to cover while I was gone, he would give me a $3,000 wedding bonus. I would get my full PTO, and when I got back, Bitch Boss would leave me alone and let me manage the complex stuff and pick two more people to permanently train back onto the sub team to backfill what we had lost. I accepted. Weddings are effing expensive. So I tried to train people to cover for me. Impossible task. Then leave on my PTO. I had a great wedding and honeymoon. VP called me a few times when the fourth guy from my sub team quit with no notice about 1.5 weeks in, but I ignored him and didn't respond. I come back refreshed and ready for the crap show I know is waiting. It was chaos. All the salespeople were slacking and emailing me about all the complex things they needed done two weeks ago. The people I quickly trained before leaving hadn't been able to do almost anything. There was a huge backlog for the entire team, as half of the original 16-person team was gone at this point. I turned off my Slack and emailed the sales VPs directly, asking them to give me a prioritized list of all the complex deals they needed done. Got the list and started working through it in my normal working hours, nothing more. Bitch Boss never tried to talk to me or interfere. VP did a few times. At one point, he tried to make me work weekends to catch up, I refused. This went on for about a month or so. Bitch Boss never mentioned me training people to replace my sub team, and I never brought it up. They did, however, have the larger team try some of the smaller complex projects to help get them out. They also hired some new people for the larger team. The normal four to six month training process my old boss developed was ignored, and the new hires were just thrown in the deep end, which resulted in new hires making mistakes that cost the company a lot of money. This brought us to annual bonus and raise time. I had started frantically job hunting as soon as I got back from the honeymoon. I got some interviews, was in some later stages, but no offers yet. I had a Zoom meeting invite from Bitch Boss to go over my bonus and raise. She decided it would be a great idea to give me 80% of my expected bonus, the lowest possible, and a 0% raise. Justified it with a bunch of BS, not a team player, metrics bad, blaming me for mistakes made by new hires, etc, etc. I didn't really argue or care at this point. At that point, I really quiet quit. Cut my daily output to below half, just did the bare, bare minimum, and waited for the bonus to come in with my next paycheck two weeks later. At this point, the sales team is getting pissed because the complex stuff basically isn't getting done. I had almost caught up on the important ones before the raise and bonus, but with me barely working, everything was falling behind again. Bitch Boss smelled weakness and showed up on one of the progress calls I had with sales. The project was running about one and a half weeks behind at that point. She started chewing me out on the call in front of everyone, saying I was lazy and not doing my job, etc. I let her rant, then just said, if you give me the lowest bonus possible and a 0% raise, you get 0% effort in return. You can complete this project since I'm so terrible at my job. And I left the call. She tried a few more times on email chains, etc. to call me out for not working, and I just replied with the same thing. I refused to join her Zoom calls or respond to her on Slack, and just responded with the 0% effort blurb on every email. This infuriated her. I still hadn't gotten another job offer, but was really confident I was about to get one soon. So when VP set up a Zoom call with me, I joined. He tried to play nice and ask what the problems were and pretended to be on my side. I told him for a 0% raise, I'm giving 0% effort and he pretended like he had no idea how I ended up with that raise and bonus. He has to approve the bonus and raise amounts. I called him out on his BS and told him he gets what he pays for. He then threatened to fire me if I didn't go back to my old level of output and said the people I had been training in complex projects could take over for me soon, so I wasn't as necessary as I thought. I laughed and asked him what he was talking about. I hadn't been training anyone. He went quiet and muted. He was clearly messaging Bitch Boss, asking about the training. 
because he unmuted a few minutes later and changed his entire attitude. Agreed it was awful of Bitch Boss to do that to my bonus and raise, and asked what he could do to make it right. I didn't care at that point, and knew he needed me more than I needed him, so I told him I need a 25% raise and 150% of the bonus on that new salary, or I was quitting immediately. He tried to say that was ridiculous and could never happen, etc, etc. So I bluffed and told him I already had another job offer and was leaving anyway. He asked me to wait and he'd bring SVP onto the call. SVP tried to talk my demand down. At that point, I realized it wasn't worth it. I refused the significantly lower counteroffer, thanked the SVP for everything he did for me, and said I was quitting immediately. VP tried to say I'll never get a good reference if I don't at least work a notice period. I just told him my ex-boss would give me a glowing recommendation of my time here, so I didn't care, and I logged off. SVP tried to get me to come back a few times over the next week or so, but I refused. A few weeks later, I got a job offer and accepted. I've been working at the new company for a while now, and it's pretty crappy. Better than the old company, but nowhere close to what I had before with my old boss. Although old boss reached out and said he might have a position opening up in his new company in a month or two that I should apply for. So I'm looking forward to that. I've heard from people who are still on my old team that it's a complete disaster at my old job. They are losing millions from not having the knowledge base to correctly complete the complex projects. They reached out to the other experienced guy from the sub team and offered him a huge raise to come back after I quit. He refused. Everyone left on my old team is trying to leave ASAP and everything even the simple stuff is weeks overdue. Apparently, Bitch Boss is getting thrown under the bus by VP and will be fired soon. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Pattern Matched. It says, they got off cheap with a $3,000 wedding bonus. If these were $1 million plus deals that are in jeopardy, those sales reps could possibly be losing tens of thousands of dollars, maybe even $100,000 plus on commission. This is a great chance to do some high-priced consulting for your former employer. Stories like this, where you charge two to five times more per hour, aren't uncommon. Another commenter down below called Post Cautious said, SVP is a fool and a failure as a manager. Leaving Bitch Boss as your boss, but telling her to stay out of your way was nonsense. She's either your boss or she isn't. If you're to be responsible for hiring, training, and managing, that makes you the manager. You should have asked for her job, title, and salary. Structural failures require structural solutions, not band-aids. SVP's offer was obviously no solution. It couldn't work because he didn't change anything. He should have removed you and your team from Bitch Boss's reporting chain. Bitch Boss gets a different job or no job, but she doesn't get to keep mismanaging you to the point of disaster for the company. Further, VP was responsible for hiring Bitch Boss over better qualified internal candidates. That began the destruction of the department, which he allowed to continue. That's structural failure number two. VP should also be removed from your reporting chain. SVP should have shifted you and the entire team to himself or to a different VP. Three incompetent levels of management, each refusing to do its job. I've got a question for everybody listening and watching this one right now. Does this sound like corporate sabotage to you people? These two people came in around the same time. The VP hired somebody from their own company. I have a hard time believing that they were just incompetent enough that everything fell apart below them. It almost feels like they were there on behalf of the competition to make this place fall apart and lose millions in contracts. Going back to OP, I'm really glad you were able to get in contact with your old boss, the one that you really enjoyed working for, and I really hope that the old boss can find you a new spot on their current team. I think that would be best for you, not only for your career, but for your mental health as well. This story comes to us from Expensive Support. Dealership pulled bait and switch. It cost them over $50,000. The city I live in has extremely inflated vehicle values compared to the surrounding areas. If you buy the same car from a neighboring state, you can often save three to four thousand dollars without really trying. 
When I buy a new vehicle, which happens every three to four years, I always look in the surrounding states to compare pricing. This story happened about five years ago and the malicious compliance is still ongoing to this day. I was shopping for a new car, brand new, and found one that matched my specs about 12 hours away in a neighboring state. It was priced about $5,000 below comps. After looking up flights, there was a one-way direct flight that took me to their local airport for around $175. Plus the gas to drive back, I was looking at a total of maybe $275 to save $5,000 absolutely worth it in this situation. I reached out to the dealership, negotiated a bit, and agreed on a price. I let them know that I would be flying in to pick up the car, and offered to pay in full in advance of the flight. They told me that all they needed was a $1,000 deposit, and that the car was considered mine. We signed a contract and I paid the deposit, and then I booked the flight for three days from then. First signs of things gone awry. When I showed up at the airport, the dealership was supposed to pick me up. This had been arranged in advance. A quick phone call later, and I grabbed an Uber to take me the 20 miles to the dealership with the promise of them covering that cost. No big deal either way. Second sign of things gone awry, when I showed up at the dealership, the salesman I had been speaking with asked me if I wanted to walk the lot with him to look at a few cars. Yes, cars, plural. Questioning what he meant by that, we walked into the lot to see these cars that he was talking about. Were these some special type of gold inlaid full self-driving, full self-flying Amazemobiles? No, they were not. When I point blank asked to see the car that I was buying, the one with VIN number XYZ listed in this signed contract with a deposit on it, I was told it was no longer available. The salesman offered to show me similar cars, which would have been fine were we able to come to similar terms on pricing. But all of these cars were outrageously priced. Think $2,000 over MSRP instead of $5,000 under MSRP. Important note for later, there was never a mention or any paperwork, signage, etc. of any incentives for giving 5-star reviews. Fast forward 2-3 to three hours. I am now convinced this dealership never had this specific car on the lot and that this was 100% a bait and switch gone wrong. The dealership was unwilling to sell me a similar vehicle at a similar price to our negotiated one. We were over $5,000 apart and were unwilling to pay the flight costs for this bait and switch scenario. A heated discussion ensued between myself and the GM where he told me to go ahead and leave a bad review but that I wasn't getting any free money from him. I took an Uber to a nearby hotel and booked a flight back home for the next day. Total cost, around $750. Cue malicious compliance. This dealership had an average Google rating of right around 4.5 stars and around 400 total reviews. Pretty solid for a dealership. That night, while I was sitting in the hotel room, I had some time to burn. I spent a couple of hours creating new email accounts just so that I could leave multiple reviews for this dealership. All said and done, I had left around 20 one-star reviews over the course of that night and then sort of stopped caring about reviews. At this point, my focus shifted to recovering my lost travel expenses. A few days after getting back, I sent the dealership a demand letter for $750, which they promptly ignored. Since we had done the original contract with the deposit in both states, I was allowed to file a small claim suit in my state, which I did. The dealership never showed up to court, and I received a default judgment for $750. I did collect that, by the way. It took a few certified letters, a few phone calls, and about a year, but I did get a check for $750. As you can imagine, I was still not a happy camper. What they had done was wrong on so many levels. All my friends knew the story of how I was baited and switched, and the fact that I flew to the dealership on a one-way ticket only made it that much worse. They had all left a bad review or two, but nothing more than a normal mad customer. Cue malicious compliance long term. I don't know how it started or how it ended up lasting as long as it has, but at some point, I had some time on my hands and left a bad review for this dealership. 
Just one, not two, not three, one. In doing so, I noticed that all of the reviews I had left right after leaving the dealership were gone, probably taken down for being fake or because I had left so many at the same time and the dealership reported them. I wanted to make sure this dealership wouldn't do this to someone else, so the next day, I checked to make sure that one bad review I had just left was still there. It was, and since I was thinking about it, I went ahead and created another account and left another one-star review. Fast forward two to three years, it has now become a habit. Every time I have a few minutes to spare, I create a new account and leave a one-star review for this dealership. Their current rating? 1.9 stars with nearly 3,500 total reviews. I am personally responsible for at least half of those reviews. When you open the dealer's website, one of the large banners that flashes across the screen advertises $50 for a 5-star review, something about showing the review to your salesman to get a $50 Visa gift card. It has been this way since about a year after this bait-and-switch occurred, right around the time the one-star reviews began to accumulate. Assuming I am responsible for half of their reviews, and the fact that the dealership only has 3,500 total reviews, they have paid $50 per review for at least 1,000 reviews, likely more than that. Meaning, they have implemented a policy to pay for reviews, have spent $50,000 doing so, and have still seen their average rating drop consistently since telling me to go ahead and leave a bad review. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called RDKing647. It says, you could probably report them to Google. I think paying for five-star reviews is against their terms of service. Another commenter down below called Retsuko's mom said, did you get your $1,000 deposit back too? Maybe I missed it, but I only see the $750 judgment mentioned. OP responded and said, yes, I left the deposit with a credit card and it was refunded with no issue. OP, you signed a contract with these people and gave them a deposit for a specific VIN number. I would have a lawyer look over that contract because it seems to me like this would be a little bit more than a small claims issue. Now, I'm in Ontario, Canada and things might be different here, but I do have a car contract on my desk here right now because I have a new car coming in April. And it says it's for a specific VIN and there's nothing on there about swapping it out for any other like vehicles. I'm not sure what the statute of limitations is on this, but I'd still have a lawyer look over that contract. This story comes to us from Terioku31. Denied leave on a day with no work, so I'll take them on days I have work. I'm a teacher at a small, new school. We currently have two year levels, so our teaching schedules are incredibly light. This means every teacher has at least one day where they have no classes, and it's common to take leave on that day. Mine is Friday. I realize we will move to a full schedule next month and figured I might as well use some excess leave and applied to take Fridays for the rest of the month off. Later, I was told my leave was denied because it's not nice that you get to have multiple long weekends when your colleagues don't. And I responded with, so you're saying just because my lesson free day is on a Friday, I don't get to take leave even though the science teachers can take every Tuesday off? language teachers take every Thursday, and so on. He kind of waffled around that it doesn't look good, and that I still have to consider a homeroom lesson I have Fridays, which is a student-led activity time. I'm actually not supposed to do anything or intervene, just be present while students handle everything that someone else will have to cover. I've always gotten my own covers before applying for leave, so HR has never even had to do anything. Anyway, I told him straight up that I don't mind if they want to deny my leave, but to remember that I'm there because I want to be, not because I need to be. I told him, okay, but just so you know, it was a courtesy on my end to use my leave on days with the least impact. So you're essentially telling me you'd rather me take leave on days I miss actual classes, which I have no qualms doing. He kind of mumbled something, and then I thanked him and left. So that Friday, I came in, and then the following Monday, I called in sick and missed my class. I have about 20 leave days to use over the next 7-ish months, not counting school holidays, that make up the final year of my contract here. 
and I plan to use all of them. I've also told them on a separate occasion that there's literally no downside to me whether or not they approve or deny my leave request because 80% of the leave I've taken in the past two years has been unpaid because I don't care about the money. Once, they denied a three-day unpaid leave request and I told a colleague I can just not show up. What are they going to do? Not pay me? That's literally what I asked for in the first place. So either way, I get what I want. They need me more than I need them, as the sole teacher of the most popular elective subject in the school. It's somewhat niche, so it's not easy to just find a replacement. Not to mention, I have both qualifications and experience in my subject's industry, so any replacement they do find is probably not going to be as good. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Jules Deathwish. It says, Most managers don't know how to effectively deal with employees, who aren't motivated through fear. The threat of losing employment is such a standard tactic that they've forgotten that others exist. OP responded and said, honestly, so true. They're learning it a lot because of the number of single teachers here who aren't completely dependent on their job. The ones who never kick up a fuss tend to have families to support. Just this morning, another announcement was made that they forgot we actually have work scheduled on the Sunday following spring break. Half of us won't even be in the country and booked flights months ago. One colleague, whose contract ends next Tuesday, has pestered three of the four leadership team members about us now being forced to use our leave on a day we assumed was off, despite the principal literally saying, if you come in, there's no work to do. I know another two colleagues who are upset with this news too, considering they will be working nine days straight prior to spring break, which they're now being told is cut one day shorter. This was a great story, but we need to remember that OP comes from a privileged background. They even mentioned that in another comment down below. They have enough of a financial backing that they don't need to work, so they're not worried about being fired or having time off where they're not paid. This does not apply to the majority of people probably listening to this right now. I'm willing to bet a good portion of the people listening to this are in a job where the bosses push them around, but they just take it because they need the paycheck. And another good job is pretty hard to find. This story comes to us from just having a mooch. It's rude to whisper. Hi all, I've been reading this subreddit for a while now, but never really thought I had anything to share. However, I've just remembered a little story from when I was a kid and thought it belonged here. Let me know if it doesn't. The context. I have an aunt, I'll call her Susan for the sake of this post, and she has a son who I'll call John. John is very similar age to me, so I would spend a lot of time with John when I was little, and he would spend a lot of time at my parents' house. Susan wasn't married to John's father. Let's call him Harry, but they were in a relationship at the time. It wasn't a great relationship, though. All of that is relevant, I think. So with that sorted, let's move on to the story. This story takes place on a day that Susan had been arguing with Harry. They lived together at the time, and she'd left the house to get away from him. She decided to come round to visit my mom to vent, and I was home as well. While Susan and my mom were talking, the doorbell went. Harry had turned up with John, and they were both outside. Susan quickly ran upstairs to avoid seeing him, and I was told not to let Harry know she was there. I'm guessing Harry was over because he wanted to know if my mom had heard from Susan or wanted to drop John off so he could go look for her. I don't really know. I was pretty young at the time, and that wasn't what I was thinking about. What I was thinking was that I needed clarification on the rule that I'd just been given. You can probably see where this is going. My mom answered the door and started to speak to Harry. Meanwhile, I started tugging at her, trying to get my mom's attention to be able to ask her a question in private. After a little while, with me trying to find a way of whispering to my mom, she eventually says in frustration, OP, it's rude to whisper. Anything you want to say, you can say out loud. At this point, there's nothing I can do except ask in the raised voice of a child who has been told to speak up. I know I'm not allowed to tell Harry but can I tell John his mom's upstairs? Cue a stunned silence in which my mortified mother mentally processes what just happened and comes to terms with the fact she couldn't even tell me off 
for doing exactly what she said. Harry, bless him, tried to pretend he hadn't heard anything, even if it was painfully obvious that he must have heard, and left shortly after. John stayed and saw Susan. Susan later went back home, and I'm guessing she argued with Harry some more. They really weren't great for each other. And as for my mom, I don't think she ever really lived it down. I think she still catches her breath when she remembers how awkward that moment was. And she never told me not to whisper again. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Shrojo18. It says, What I'm surprised about is that when Harry clearly found out his partner was there, he showed enough respect to not act upon it there. OP responded to this one and said, Harry was classy in a lot of ways. I started to type some out, but it got long, so I deleted it. But he truly was a great guy a lot of the time. He was probably the better half of that relationship in many ways. Susan? Ugh. I don't really like Susan. She's been a pain since before Harry, according to my parents. My dad grew up with her, and my mom has been dating my dad and watching Susan argue with their family since before Harry. Susan would never have shown that level of class. She'd have stormed upstairs without asking if she could come in. Kids are kids, and sometimes they do dumb things. This situation just turned out really well for everybody, though. Harry showed that he was a class character and left them alone anyway. He knew she needed time to herself, accepted that, and moved on. This one reminded me of my own children, where I can't have a secret with one of them because it'll either accidentally come out or purposely be told to the other two kids here. <laughs> this story comes to us from Mama Nay 2020 You want me to do what I'm told because you are the boss? Okay. I'd been reminded of this incident recently when I happened to run into one of my former bosses. And this is a story of malicious compliance. Many times, I'd mentioned during other conversations with them that I'd previously come from the private sector and was not used to how things were run even after several years, in local government, and definitely that those ways would never, ever fly in private sector, especially when it came to money. I had been tasked with being the liaison for returning money and personal property to people that were either victims or the perpetrators. Laws don't allow us to know which category individuals fell under. But if a judge said, give their property back to them, that's what I did, with the correct paperwork, period. Of course, there were procedures, proper paperwork had to be filled out, and a valid and current state identification or driver's license, a court order, and an evidence voucher was needed. Everything had to match on all of the paperwork. Their full name, address, city, and state. And a property receipt from the police department. If they came to me with a receipt that said, John Q. Doe, then their identification had to say the same. Not Jack Doe, not J.Q. Doe, you get it. It was supposed to be a surefire way to make sure that the right person claimed the property. And 99.99% .99 of the time, it was money, US dollars. And our department was entrusted to follow the rules. Well, the supervisor and the department head, let's call them TD and TL, were both in rare form this particular day during our routine morning meeting, when they both had attitudes about everything. It probably had something to do with the fact that they were being applauded for running a tight ship and getting things done. Yeah, right. All they had to do was sign their names to things. The staff did all of the hard work. And yet contradicting everything said between one and the other, and walking around with their chests out like they were God's gifts. And in not so many words, both professing, I'm the boss, I want it done this way or that way. If I say something, that's the way I want it. Do it and don't question me. Okay, I thought, and I've been asked before at other jobs, are you sure, really sure? Because I was taught to do just that, give you exactly what you want, and usually people end up not liking it. They both were so nasty in their response that I just smiled at my friend and coworker across the table who shook her head and did a facepalm. Why? Because she knows me. Okay, it's on. I'm going to do it your way, without question, because you two are the boss. At around 11 a.m., I get a call from the security desk that a visitor had arrived with a property receipt, etc., and wanted to know if I would come and collect them to get the process started. Sure, I'll be down in about 10 to 15 minutes, I told them. 
as I was in the process of counting money and needed to focus. As on any given day, there was around $100,000 in cash on my desk and I didn't want to put the money back in the safe and start all over. When I finally finished counting the money and went downstairs to collect the visitor, the visitor was clearly agitated. Was I bothered? Kind of, but I was secure enough knowing that there were 400 or so officers with pew pews in the building. So I led the visitor up to my office, had them seated, took their information, and began the process. Except, one, the voucher looked old. Two, the name on the voucher didn't match the receipt. Three, the receipt nor the voucher matched the court order. And four, their ID was expired. Alert, alert, giant red flags waving in the breeze. Everything, everything that I'd been taught was screaming at me that this was bad and that it was going to end badly. I made the necessary copies for my records of all the information like always, except this time, two of everything, and actually circled all of the discrepancies in red marker, and then told the visitor that I needed to get the checkbook from another office. It would take a little while to get the signatures needed, and release of funds requires two other signatures. I first went to my immediate supervisor, TL, and explained the situation to her. I showed her every single solitary piece of paperwork, pointed out all of which I'd circled, that the information didn't match on any of the forms in any way at all. She literally did a quick scan and said, it's okay, do it. I know that I stood there with my mouth opening and closing, with no words coming out for a full two minutes, shaking my head and in shock, before I said, wait, did you really look at what I'm showing you? There's something wrong with all of it. I think it's forgery and fraud about to be committed. Her words were, I said do it, while pushing all of the paperwork across her desk back to me. Are you sure? Do you want to look at it again? Do you realize that I'm supposed to cut a check for $97,000? I asked. No, it's fine, do it, so that you can get back to your other work. I then told her that I was really uncomfortable completing the transaction and that I wanted to speak to TD about it. And so I walked across the hall, tapped on TD's door, and asked if we could discuss the transaction. Now mind you, TD is the department head, one of the signatures needed to finalize the paperwork. The other person to sign would be the accounts payable department head. I spread both sets of copies of the papers across his desk, and again, explained in detail the situation and what was wrong with all of it. At least he took a few more minutes to pour over the paperwork, unlike TL. And so I thought, okay, he's paying attention. He'll see everything that's wrong with this. He'll make a call downstairs and have a couple of officers up here in no time. Nope, he literally said, it's all good, do it. TD, it's not all good, please. Please look at it all again, I pleaded. Now is a good time to tell everyone that I worked for lawyers for five years straight out of high school, and one of the best things that I've ever learned was what definitely became my lifelong motto, cover your own butt and don't take the fall for other people. And that mindset has been good to me. Again, I pleaded with TD to look closely at the paperwork. I pointed out all of the discrepancies again, the wrong name, the paper being the wrong color and looking old, the expired state ID, everything. And again, he said, I said do it. Okay, I thought, this is one of the times when you know for certain that this is going to come back and bite you in the butt. But remember when I said that I worked for lawyers for five years in my earlier career? Well, I remembered them always saying, signatures are everything. Now, normally, the only time I would need signatures are when the checks are actually cut, but this time, I was definitely going to take it oh so much further. Back out to the copier I went for one more copy of all the paperwork. First stop was the supervisor, TL. TL, I need your signature to finish this transaction. Sign and date here, 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 and here. Yes, everywhere I'd made a notation in red marker. Thank you. And off I went back to TD to get his signature. Sorry to bother you, TD, but I need your signature and date here, 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 and here. All the while thinking, you two won't be having me accused and arrested for conspiring with a total stranger. With that done, I asked TD one more time 
Are you sure that you want me to complete this transaction? After everything that I've pointed out, cut a check and send the visitor on his way. TD never looked up from what he was reading and said, yes. So that's what I did. Completed the steps necessary to cut the $90,000 check and send the visitor on his merry way. Three weeks later, all hell broke loose. OP, my office now. My head has never whipped back and forth so fast in my entire life as they both talked at the same time. TD beat red and TL wringing her hands in frustration. Shut the door, TL said. And then I could barely understand what was being said, but eventually figured out that it was about the transaction and check that I'd written prior. Yep. We, and I say we very loosely, handed over close to $100,000 to the wrong person. They handed me a record of everything that was currently happening because of that transaction. The commissioner's memo, the judge's orders, the investigation procedures, the assigned case number and detectives, the names of the bank representatives. I was told that there was an ongoing investigation and I'd be contacted by the bank and detectives shortly. And lastly, that I might be fired. What do you have to say for yourself? TD asked forcefully while slapping the top of his desk. To which I replied, I did what I was supposed to do. I did what I was told to do. Don't you remember signing off on it all? I said matter-of-factly. They both spluttered something to the effect of, I would never. I have an MBA and I've been doing this for 30 years. No, this is your mistake. This is not going to end well for you, etc. I almost burst out laughing because it very much sounded like the teacher from the Charlie Brown cartoons. You know, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> But I was in no way worried. I calmly got up out of the chair that I'd been perched on the edge of, excused myself, walked to my office, picked up my purse and got my desk key out, opened the drawer and pulled out the folder that I had made of that one particular transaction. I had purposely kept it separate from the other copies, just in case those papers somehow magically disappeared. Since TL was commonly and routinely famous for going through our desks, I walked back to TD's office and sat the folder on his desk in front of him and waited. What's this? TD asked me. Just open it, I said. He spent more time going through those papers than he had when he should have been paying a heck of a lot more attention three weeks ago. He finally looked across his desk at me with wide eyes and I just blinked back at him, not saying a word. TL asked, well, what is it? And so he hands her the file but never takes his eyes off of me. I swear, in that moment, I could hear her gulp loudly. For me, it was an, oh, so you think that I'm going to take the fall for this one moment? No, nope, not today, not tomorrow, not next month, not ever. And then I waited some more. You could definitely hear a feather drop. The room had gotten so quiet. As I said, I did what I was supposed to do, just like you two told me. Anything else you need me to clear up? I asked. TD and TL couldn't speak. Neither could find their voices in the moment, so I just quietly left the office, shut the door behind me, and smiled all the way back to my office. What happened with the ongoing investigation, I'll never know. The subject was never brought up again. Heck, I did just what they both told me to do. They're the bosses, right? Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Flyrun. It says, So what happened to that folder you presented? TD and TL could have easily taken it from you right then. Or did you keep a copy to cover your butt and hand it over to the bank and or detectives? With such a big investigation, I'm surprised that they weren't fired or charged. I'm not sure that OP handled this one the same way that I would have. I think I would have held on to that paperwork, kept a copy at home, away from where the ones that could disappear were, and I would have waited for that investigation to start and then produce the evidence right then and there to the detectives and the investigators that were going over everything. Why give all the evidence to the bosses before the investigations even started? That just means they can make it disappear and make themselves look better. And unfortunately, it sounds like that's what happened in this case, because OP says that they never heard anything about it ever again. 
I just feel like a big opportunity was wasted here, where the investigation could have just brought this down completely on both of the bosses in this case. This story comes to us from First Desponder. Was denied two days of paid PTO, so I took off a whole month. When I worked corrections, I requested for two weeks off. I had been there for years and accrued plenty of paid leave. It was given to me as I had done so months in advance for a personal event. The two weeks went by way too quick. I had specifically lined up my two-week break to lead into my two days off at the beginning of the break and at the end so I could maximize my time off. However, during my normal off days, a family emergency came up that was quite serious. So I asked for another two days off to handle my situation. I was told by my direct supervisor that there was no way she was approving that because we were only allowed to use 84 hours of leave in one continuous block. Given our rotating written schedules and 12 hour shifts, this equaled two weeks. She ordered me to come in the next day or I would receive a write up. I didn't argue because I knew she was correct. So I showed up that night and reported for my shift and much to my surprise, my captain had called out sick. So a relief captain came in to fill her shift. I asked him to give me the next day off after my shift was over. He and I had a rapport given the number of years we've worked with each other previously. And so he looked at the schedule and my leave. He said, you know you've got plenty of leave, right? Yes, I know. I just need some of it to handle my business tomorrow. No, I mean you've got plenty of leave to take. And the roster is filled the next two weeks. Yeah, I just got off a two-week vacation. I stopped because he winked at me. And it finally clicked. We can only take up to two weeks off consecutively. Nothing says we can't take off two weeks. Come in for, say, an hour. Then go home and take off another two weeks. So I did. And he signed all the paperwork. Stating, it's not my shift. F that be. I handled my emergency literally the next day. It turned out to not be as serious as we thought. And then enjoyed another paid two weeks off from work. It was great. To add to the bliss, I reported back from work to find out that this captain was fired and replaced for some kind of negligence or something. It was a great month. OP clarified at the bottom it says, edit, the captain I worked for was fired. The captain everyone liked, who gave me the PTO, stayed for a couple more years before retiring. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Underbelly. It says, Jesus, only in America is using your earned, owed vacation time considered malicious compliance. OP responded and said, what's even more shameful is how corrupt our correction system is. It's all just a business, and they don't care about the officers, the staff, or the inmates. What an awesome captain that was. Just rolls in there and says to OP, Oh, you've got all this PTO? Well, you might as well take a whole month off. <laughs> I really wasn't expecting the icing on the cake being that the other captain was let go by the time that OP came back. I mean, that was the best case scenario. OP got to spend a whole bunch more time with the great captain in charge, and I'm sure they got everything they wanted. This story comes to us from Red Martali. You really want me to log time by the ticket? I'm sure all of you reading this have to log their work time in one way or another. And I'm sure most of you don't agree with the granularity of said logging. So I work in IT. Many years ago, I was involved in a big project, creating a new platform while maintaining the old one. So during the week, I would spend some time on support tickets. My role was more high level. I would never be the one to actually work on a ticket. At one point in time, there was a new support coordinator assigned to the client account. The number of tickets was rising and the team couldn't keep up, threatening the new platform. The coordinator needed metrics on the team's performance, so he generated reports from the ticketing and the time logging systems, combined them, and started looking into improvements until he came across my logs. The metrics told him, I spent about two hours a week and edit a varying amount of tickets. This looks weird and he couldn't bill the clients on tickets I worked on. So he asked me what was going on. I explained that I would look over the list of open tickets, bulk update where needed and log my time with a remark like classified tickets. Then I would move on to my other duties. He didn't like that 
and told me to enter a time log for each separate ticket I work on. I asked him what the minimum time was that he wanted me to log, which turned out to be 15 minutes. Fast forward a few weeks of me spending an hour a day logging hours, and logging that task too, and creating virtual overtime of about an hour a day. Then, the coordinator comes up to me with a request to go through and update the full backlog. I'm fine with that, and tell him I'm logging that as a generic task and not per ticket. He tells me no, it must be logged per ticket. So finally, the malicious compliance. I spent about two hours to go over the backlog and make sure everything is in order. Then, I spend the rest of the day entering everything into the time logging system. Fun fact, I was the first to reach the system's limits, but found a workaround to log everything. That day, as logged in the time tracking software, I worked for more than 16 hours. The rest of the week, I took it easy, came in late, went home early, I was done for the week, and every hour I worked extra would be unpaid, right? When it came time for invoicing, the coordinator could not justify the huge amount of hours I logged on the account. My rate was twice that of a tech support. And finally, he allowed me to stop logging by the ticket. My productivity went up again, as did my mood. I did flag the potential problems and drop in productivity to the CTO and CEO, who I reported to directly, but they said to comply anyway. We did laugh about it afterwards, and learned a lesson and how not to waste time. Thank you for reading my story. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Dynamite Disco Dave. <laughs> it says, Sometimes Manglement needs to actually sit and think and actually research before opening their pie hole. But well done. I sincerely hope that when OP was logging the hours for those tickets for each one of them, there was a note that said, Logging 15 minutes as per the request of supervisor such and such. That way, OP could completely cover their butt. Now, one thing we've learned from a lot of these malicious compliance stories in the past is that you always should get things in writing. So the only other thing I would have done differently here is I would have requested from the supervisor that they send me an email confirming that they want me to put in 15 minutes for each one of the tickets that I worked on. That way, I'd have something to go back on if they ever came to me and said, Hey, you can't be booking all these hours. You didn't do that much work. This story comes to us from Tosspot99. Are you sure you want to do this by the book? Many moons ago, I spent my youth in the army. I worked in comms and spent some excellent years doing dumb crap with some of the best guys and girls you could ever meet. One of those years of my misspent youth, I was deployed to a hot and sandy location. This length of deployment was unusual for me, as most deployments in the British Army are six months. The extra time was due to us being one of the first units deployed, and after supporting the initial deployment, they requested volunteers to remain and support and train some of the relieving units and newly deployed logistics headquarters. At this stage of my career, I had been unlucky enough to jump from deployment to deployment, and I was loving the extra money that that gave me, so I happily volunteered to stay. I was tasked with supporting one of the logistics HQs. I'd run that detachment earlier in the deployment and was happy to return, as it was far away from the main HQ, and all the bored adults and seniors that the HQ brings. Think sweeping the desert, that kind of thing. Our little detachment was an oasis in a sea of BS. It was just six guys and girls with me as the detachment commander. I was a corporal at the time. The isolated nature of our detachment meant that anyone sent there had to be able to operate independently, be very adaptable and open to improvise to support where required. Our main unit also liked to send us their troublemakers, but due to the nature of the detachment, they could only send us people who could do their role also. So I ended up with all the best and most interesting scum of my unit, and it was amazing. For any Yanks reading, it would have been E4 Mafia Paradise. Within four weeks, we had a patio and rock garden set up. We had a barbecue pit, shower area, gym. We'd sorted a deal with the local civilian contractors for us to receive beer in exchange for our help in vehicle and generator servicing. The best part was, due to us being a comms detachment, it was restricted entry to our area, so we were free from any surprise visits. 
Now that I've set out the backstory, I'll get on to the malicious compliance. The HQ we were supporting was regularly rotating its senior, non-commissioned officers, and officers from the deployment. They'd do the minimum time to qualify for a medal, and they'd get replaced with someone new. It was a crappy practice that eventually got shut down, but not till much later deployments. We were fairly used to this by now, and the only overhead we had was creating new accounts for the seniors. The guys who actually did the work, my peer group in the HQ, stayed the same mostly. This latest rotation saw the old regimental quartermaster sergeant being replaced by a new, promoted quartermaster sergeant. This new guy was a prick, full of his own self-importance, hated that we had a little island of BS-free tranquility within his eyesight. I'd see him pacing outside our fence line when he first arrived, unable to comprehend that he wasn't allowed to just walk in. By this point, I had been in this location for about six months, and I was thoroughly past the point of giving any Fs. The RQMS hated that he had to deal with me, a lowly full screw, as OC of the detachment, and myself and crew of reprobates was out of his chain of command. One day, he absolutely lost his crap because we were barbecuing half a goat and had invited a few of his guys to join us after work for some beers and delicious goat wraps. By this stage, we'd used Hessian to fence off our barbecue and bar area so that we could obscure it from prying eyes. He went off to get some of his unit's regimental police, RPs, these are not real military police, just jobs worth, with no real job in a unit, to come and shut us down. I told them to jog on, they weren't getting in my detachment, and I don't care who sent them. Apparently the next day, he was apoplectic. The guys who worked with him warned us he was determined to bring my detachment to heel. His solution was removing our welfare package that we were issued through his department as a favor from his guys for some services we were providing. It consisted of a small fridge, TV, and British Forces Broadcasting Service TV decoder. The conversation went roughly as thus. Corporal Tosspot, it appears that there's been a paperwork error and you've been given one of my welfare packages by mistake. Okay, sir, I'd be happy to fill that in. Shall I drop by your office? You can drop by my office and bring the package, but you won't be filling in any paperwork, Corporal. You may have wrangled the last RQ, but as far as I'm concerned, you lot can do one if you think you're getting that welfare package back off me. And if there's anything else that I find that isn't 100% correct paperwork-wise, then I'll be shutting that right down. You may not be mine, and I may not be able to enter your little compound, but I'm going to have you, son. Every resup demand, every transport request better be completed correctly. I'm going to make your lives hell with paperwork and admin. Q malicious compliance. I'm sorry to hear that, sir. I'm sorry you feel the service that we provide isn't good enough. The old RQMS was very happy with services that he was getting from us and sent over the spare welfare package as a thank you. Are you sure that it's paperwork that's the issue here? Are you not happy with phones and the internet? Corporal, I have no complaints regarding the comms. You just need to complete the correct paperwork and have it authorized by me. At this point, it is clear that he is never going to authorize the return of the welfare package and is very smug about it. Okay, sir, you're of course correct. Paperwork is essential. Are you giving me attitude, Corporal? No, not at all, sir. Just agreeing with you. To be clear, you are happy with everything else we provide to the HQ. You just want me to complete the correct paperwork? That's correct, Corporal. No problem, sir. Happy to oblige. I delivered the welfare package back to his stores. His guys were very apologetic. I told them not to worry. You see, the welfare package was a thank you for all the extra phone lines and terminals that we'd provided for the previous RQMSs. This expanded his and his unit's working capacity. Most importantly, I had run phone line to the sleeping areas so that him and his lads could call home without using their limited welfare phone cards. I'd also laid some precious unfiltered internet lines too. Internet to deployed units is very rare, and unfiltered internet is almost unheard of for British units. What I was providing was immense value to lonely squaddies, and it was also without paperwork. 
When I got back to my detachment, I flicked a couple of switches, turning off all the paperworkless connections. I waited for the inevitable. It didn't take long. The first visitor was one of the privates, letting us know he'd been cut off mid-call back home. I apologized and explained what was going on with the RQMS. He understood, not happy about it, but understood. He went off muttering about throbbers who can't leave well enough alone. The next was one of the RQMS's full screws, who I have a lot of time for. She came around and asked what was going on with the comms. She was in the office when I had the conversation with the RQMS earlier. We had a bit of a chat about what a belter he is, and then she asked what was going on. I explained that as per the RQMS's request, we are following his example and doing things by the book, and I've turned off all services without the correct paperwork. She looked at me knowingly. So what does that mean? She asked. I explained that the only services that I had been ordered to provide were for the HQ. The rest would have to request them through me and be approved by a division HQ as per orders. I handed her a copy of the request forms to be completed in triplicate as I didn't have a photocopier and they couldn't send it to me by email as I just turned their kit off. She had a bit of a chuckle and went back to her boss, paperwork in hand. You see, the only orders I had were for the six lines and terminal in the HQ. The 30 odd lines I would laid extra were essentially me being a good bloke and supporting the mission and departments as they grew around the HQ. It was initiative and adaptability on my part. These were all now off, and I had a steady stream of visitors throughout the day wanting to know what was going on. I directed them all to the RQMS who had the request forms. My last visitor was the operations captain. He was a top bloke, a late entry officer, had gone through the ranks from private to regimental sergeant major, and was now commissioned as an officer, who had spent more than a few nights in our compound with a beer and talking crap with us. He was one of the very first recipients of a private line and internet. He asked me what was going on. He'd been round the houses, so he knew there were shenanigans afoot. I told him the situation. His face dropped. Leave it with me is all that he said, and off he went. 30 minutes later, the RQMS was back at the entrance to my compound with the welfare package. The ops captain was with him, looming over him as only an RSM, or former RSM in this case, can. Hello, sir. How can I help? Hello, Corporal. There seems to have been an error, and we found your paperwork for the welfare package, so I'm returning it with my apologies. No need to apologize, sir. Easy mistake to make. So, are we good? And the other paperwork moving forward? There's no need for all that. Looking over his shoulder at the ops captain, we are, after all, on the same team. We are indeed, sir. I looked over my shoulder and gave one of my guys a nod. I think you'll find everything is now back to as it was. Excellent. Thank you very much, Corporal. And off he went. The ops captain stared daggers at him as he left. He just gave me a nod and confirmed that drinks were still on for the next day and toddled off back to his pit. I was never bothered by the RQMS again. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Responsible and 7361 It says, As a former supply guy, anything IT and comms needed, they got. Oddly, we always had great IT connections and service. Don't piss off medical. Don't piss off supply. Don't piss off comms in IT. The next commenter down below called Professor Tech Support said, General life lesson, do not ever piss off the people who provide you with the necessities. Only piss off the people who provide you with comforts if you're willing to live without them. I would add one more thing onto that last comment. I would make sure that your bosses are willing to live without them too. Because as we saw in this story, if the bosses aren't willing to live without those creature comforts that they're used to, it will come down on you. This story comes to us from FeistyB7779. Sure, we can follow the contract. I work as an account manager for a food distribution company. I have an NDA, so I can't disclose the type of materials or type of project, so that will be relatively vague, but the story is still good. Okay, 
so we work with the chain account and service all of their locations in our state. This is a relatively small but global chain that is historically very challenging to work with. Management is aggressive, pushy, just not nice. Our company is a tiny, family-owned and operated company full of nice goofballs. We don't take things too seriously, provide great service, and put up with, honestly, way too much from them. We're their contracted distributor. There are a few items in the contract that no one follows and hasn't followed for years. One of those being monthly pricing audits. No one from their corporate had ever asked for it, but we never brought it up because our pricing is not always consistent with the contracted price we are supposed to charge the locations. Reason being is we're often able to get a product for cheaper elsewhere and also sell to our other accounts outside of this chain. So we're not always compliant, but it's always for the benefit of the customer. Well, our direct contact at the company quit and the head honcho over there stepped in to take her place. He insisted that we begin sending monthly pricing audits per the contract. Mind you, this guy is just nasty. I've had to drive around to every location in the state to recover a product the locations use less than one case of a year because they wanted to teach us a lesson for running out of something one time. They assign us complaint forms that I have to go into their site and resolve the complaint. It's usually about something stupid. You said that you were going to receive a product on this day, but you didn't tell us you got it yet. Please write out your five-step action plan and solution to being better partners to us. Ugh. So anyway, we dragged out the audits for a while, but were unable to avoid it. So we brought up another item in the contract that had been neglected in attempts to be like, if you're going to enforce this, we're going to enforce the whole contract. It stated that if we were carrying an item for this account that moved less than X number of cases a week, that we would be able to charge a storage fee per month that it sat in our warehouse. They said, yes, we need to be following the contract 100%. Well, we found that almost 90% of the products did not move X number of cases a week and were eligible for a storage fee to be added on. The language stated that we were also to back charge for the months that it sat in the warehouse that we did not charge storage, which meant that there were items that had a price increase of $30 per case. That's ridiculous, especially for a restaurant in our state. We alerted the company and said, hey, while this would be more money for us, we really don't want to do that to our customers. They said it didn't matter and we had to follow the contract. And if any stores complained, I was to send them directly to their corporate rep. So the updated contract pricing went into effect, effectively bumping up pricing on their most popular items by about 10% and the storage pricing by about 30% on their lowest moving items, increasing overall pricing by about 25%. Stores are livid. It totally sucks for them and I feel super bad about it but it's a result of their corporate being buttholes. The best part is now I get these complaint things about pricing all day long, and I just get to tag their corporate representatives to deal with it instead. I have less work, and we make about 25% more off an account. They want us to follow the contract, right? Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Gemini27. It says, sounds like some kind of internal power struggle between the head honcho and the stores. Head honcho was trying to find a way to point out to the store managers that head honcho had at least some power over the store's cost. So the stores better not step out of line on anything, even stupid piddly stuff coming down from head office. It damages the company profits, of course, but head honcho might not actually care about that. Or they had a bonus link to contract compliance or some such or they wanted to paint their predecessor in a bad light for not following contracts, so they could also pin something else on them too. Or they had someone in compliance or legal who had been bitching about the contracts not being followed and wanted to suck up to them for their own future career prospects. Or dot dot dot. You'd think at this point that the customers would be very quick to demand a contract renegotiation when prices go up that high just all of a sudden, 
it's really going to hurt their bottom end. I completely agree with the commenter, it does sound like head honcho was just trying to dangle their bits and make sure that everybody felt them wiggling around. This story comes to us from Earnestly Freaky. The city wanted us to get rid of native grass, so we built an urban wetland. It all goes back to the summer of 2021. I started working as a biologist at an urban farm, planning and constructing polyculture systems to research food production. I developed a plan for noxious weed control and started to construct the systems over the course of two years. During this time, we had some back and forth with the city council, who didn't understand the nature of our agriculturally zoned property. After several meetings and lots of work over two years, we'd finally made a lot of progress and reached an agreement with the city by the summer of 2023. Part of the agreement was to mow ditches and the small yard of our property's farmhouse. I'll remind you, the property is zoned as agriculture, so we have no obligation to follow residential ordinances. About halfway through the summer at the end of July, the city came onto our property and mowed our entire native pasture and what was soon to be an orchard of already planted baby trees. When we talked to them, they noted ordinances against tall grass and state noxious weed laws as a justification. The latter of which is ironic because they interrupted our system of invasive plant control by mowing in a time when we shouldn't have been spraying bioherbicide. So now, in order to remove all the invasive plants from my property and comply with all the ordinances, none of which have anything to do with water, I have created a massive urban wetland. It's huge. It's beautiful. It's wet. It's compliant to every law and ordinance. It's mine, and the city mayor who lives next door to my farm can enjoy it just as much as I enjoy it living five miles away. So now, I have a wetlands to research instead of a prairie, and I love it. Jumping into the comment section for this one, we have one from a user called Rachel Silver with their own story. It says, My mom had an urban property with an unusually large yard. She turned the whole thing into a garden. It was mostly raised beds with paths between them. There were berries and vegetables, over a dozen different kinds of mint, herbs, and medicinal plants. There were also a pair of mature dogwoods, an arbor with some flowering vine, I forget what, but it had small blue and white flowers, a central walk lined with espaliered fruit and nut trees, and a small pond with a waterfall and a bubble fountain. She registered it as a wildlife habitat with the National Wildlife Federation. I don't know what she got out of that, other than a nice sign for her yard and a certificate suitable for framing. But she was incredibly, let's go with miserly, with both her money and her time, so I assumed it was worth the hassle. The local paper did a piece about her yard when she got the certification. It was the entire front page and half the second of the Saturday local section with lots of pictures. This was back when people still read the newspaper, so it put her on the map. If you think about it, anything you can do to bring public attention to your property is to your benefit. You're doing important work, and a lot of people would be supportive if they were aware of it. If the city tried to do you dirty, those people would unleash the rage of the internet. So maybe lean into that, develop a social media presence for the farm, make short-form video content about the work you're doing. Heck, you might end up making enough money as a content creator to buy the property on the far side of the mayor's house and put in a peat bog or some crap. Okay, what I love about the original story here is that it's now completely wetlands. And what loves to be in wetland areas? Well, mosquitoes, of course. And the mayor's home is right next door. Oh my gosh, that's just too darn bad. OP did mention in another comment that they are still in a lawsuit for the damages, so I wish them all the best in getting everything out of them that they need to make this right. This story comes to us from Siski TV. Approval for everything? Okay. So I'm in IT, and where I work, my team is awesome. We are usually allowed to our own devices about everything related to the network and equipment related to keeping everything running. Our manager usually just wanted reasons for everything, and if it made sense, it was cleared same day. 
anyways, the present day. Around the beginning of the year, our hire managers decided they're going to keep a tighter leash on spending and such. So they looked to the IT department because we do at times need $6,000 of hardware for replacements, normal wear and tear over the year, and we recently did a $75,000 network rebuild because of corporate decisions. But we've kept to the assigned budget. In order to keep IT under their thumb, they've switched to requiring submitting approvals before submitting the official purchase order. So, the malicious compliance. The notice said, essentially, if IT needs to order it, we want to approve it first. So, everything gets an approval form. IT needs $75 for more post-its? Approval form. Critical stuff for an immediate response? Approval form. Basically, it's gotten to the point where something that took us one to two weeks for delivery now takes four to five weeks for the same thing, which has caused strains on everything we usually work on. Parts that need replaced are still on order, so stations and computers are offline until replacements are approved. It's satisfying watching the management scramble to mass approve things once it's brought up as impacting the site's work. Again, a case of management thinking they know better than the people who have been doing the job for a longer time. What management really doesn't understand in this case is that IT workers are in demand everywhere. It's not hard to get another job if you're good at what you do and you're not happy with where you're currently working. I'd say IT is probably the number one people you don't want to piss off in your company because they keep everything running. This story comes to us from Albonian Prince. I bet there are lots of posts like this up here. Retail employment, a great place to be when biding your time ahead of starting university as a mature student, especially when a manager is a, er, posterior. On to the shop floor at 8.50. Manager tells me I am late. I check the time. It is 8.50 by my watch and the clock on the shop floor. I say so. He tells me that we go by his watch and I am 10 minutes late. His watch is over 10 minutes ahead. Sorry, sir. I'm already thinking ahead to the end of my shift. Long day. I'm due to finish at 8 p.m. At 7.50, I am on the only live till and I take it out of service and start catching up. There was no customer at the time. Manager sees me and queries why. Time to close the store, shut tills and catch up, check your watch. He almost explodes before he realizes that I have zero interest or need to maintain employment with his store, as I am due to start university next week. I turned up the next day, sought him out before starting work, and did a time check to see what times I was going to adhere to that day. Needless to say, he used the store time rather than his wrist. He knew. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Usernames Rock. It says, fantastic, serve it right back to him. I had a boss that was the same way. If you're not 15 minutes early, you're already late. But of course, you weren't supposed to punch in 15 minutes early. This story just seems like it's a big case of time theft. The boss wanted you there early and then wanted you to stay until the end of the day. That meant they were getting an extra 10 minutes out of you that they didn't have to pay you for. Completely time theft. The way I would have combated this one is I would have brought in a stopwatch of some sort, started it when they said I needed to start, and then when it got to the 8 hour shift, or 6 hours, or whatever it was that I was scheduled for, I would start packing up and leave. And when they asked me what I was doing, I just shoved that little stopwatch in their face and say, Yep, I've been here for my allotted time. Have fun closing. Bye. This story comes to us from Big Joe Kennedy, following orders. This happened 20 years ago, but my family still laughs about it. My dad owned a painting company. I worked for him in various ways in high school and college. I also got a few friends hired on for summer work too. One morning, we were on an exterior job and my dad came by to check on the progress and speak to the foreman. He saw a friend and me on the side of the house prepping to paint. He told us to tape up the gravel stones next to the foundation and walked away. I knew he meant for us just to cover the stones to protect them when we paint, but told my friend we were going to wrap individual pieces of gravel in masking tape until my dad comes back. As my dad walks by, 
he sees us taping individual pieces and loses his mind. We had probably 25 to 30 little stones in tape. He's saying he wanted us to put a few strips of tape and paper over the gravel and is visibly frustrated by us and we are laughing. He got so mad he left and called my mom because I got a call from my mom a moment later and she was laughing hard and asking me what I did to make my dad so mad. I shared with her that we were taping individual stones and she really got a kick out of it. The foreman had worked for my dad for nearly 20 years at this point and had known me since I was a kid and knew that I did things to mess with Pops all the time. There was no fallout or blowback for my friend or me. I still remind my dad about this and he almost gets upset still saying, I couldn't believe what you were doing. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Equivalent Salary 357 It says, the more extreme the reaction of the victim, the funnier the prank. Up to a point, knowing where the line between creating a very funny reaction and just being mean is an important skill. OP responded to this one and said, I agree, my goal has always been to get that slight downward head tilt and shake back and forth while sighing reaction from my dad. Another commenter called No Entertainment 670 said, You had me laughing from the get-go. Your mom sounds like a prankster herself. OP responded and said, Thank you. Indeed, she most certainly is. My dad's mom worked at a tape manufacturing plant and would get us boxes and boxes of masking tape. One night, I thought it'd be funny to put masking tape down the hallway of the master bedroom with the sticky side facing the bedroom. This was approximately a six-foot hallway with tape crisscrossing the whole length. My mom caught me, but thought it would be funny to get dad, so she army crawled under the tape to get in the bedroom. A few hours later, we hear my dad tossing out a whole mess of foul language when trying to get to the bathroom in the middle of the night. He's a good sport after the fact. If I had ever done something like this to my dad on a job site, my dad would have found a way to get back to me on a job site as well, but made it so much more embarrassing for me. OP, watch out, because one of these days, your dad is going to get you back. Did you know every KCC video is also produced in podcast form? You can search for Karma Comment Chameleon on every major podcasting platform. I thank you for watching and listening. I hope you have a wonderful day, and we'll see you tomorrow.